it's on. Um, this is the uh, June 6th, 2023 regular uh, meeting of the Palatine Unified School District School Board and uh, the board met in closed session and took two actions. Uh, the board voted 5-0 to reject the liability claims, student versus PAUSD, LD 2223.01. And in closed session, the board voted um, yes on a student discipline case, SS 2223.03. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda order? So moved. Second. I have no student board members to ask. Uh, colleagues, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. We've got our agenda order, and we are going to start with the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Um, earlier today, we announced uh, several administrative moves after having multiple discussions with each of the administrators over a period of time. Uh, we're excited about the moves and expect each of our team members to thrive in their new settings. Uh, we've really started an era of stability across our entire system. And just reflecting back six years ago, I'm not sure that the district could have made these moves. Now we have depth and a succession plan that's benefiting our, our organization. I want to specifically thank our management association, PAMA, for their work throughout the year. Uh, I think for whatever reason, we just speak less about our administrators than the other groups. And I, I understand that, but uh, they're certainly uh, worthy of, of singling out and, and, and thanking. Uh, like PAEA and CSEA, we meet each month. And I'm always impressed with their choice to advocate on behalf of students before themselves. It is one of the things I love about PAUSD and I'm proud of each of them. Uh, just quickly, the announcement went out to the entire district, uh, all families, all staff members, but just to quickly hit on, on the four in these moves, Brittany, uh, we'll be going from Ohlone into our first principalship at Dubinick. And um, while not every personnel matter that you touch is, is fun, some are really hard, there is nothing more fun than giving somebody their first opportunity and to get to watch their face, especially um, when it wasn't necessarily expected to come in and have a conversation then to be able to look at somebody and say, how would you like to be the next principal of fill in the blank? And in this case, Dubinick, and to see that face and, and to hear the promises and then to challenge people to, to stand up to what they promise is, it's just a high point. Uh, Marcella and I had had conversations throughout the year about what's next. You know, should, um, long successful career is a principal and a, and a leader and has an amazing skill set. And we're excited about her next step in the journey to not only work here on very specific items and if anything that we've learned from reading when we brought Danae here is when you have focus and you have good people and good leaders that can focus on something specific, you get great results. And that's going to happen again with, with Marcella with us. Leslie, is, is gonna be stepping over to Escondido and another great challenge and in, in the, the deal with Leslie is she came to us as an already accomplished principal at, at multiple levels and to have her go back to Escondido, uh, which is a big complicated school with, with dual immersion and construction and all these other things. But after being successful at Dubinick, to, to say, yeah, I want to do that, and to go over and take on another challenge really speaks to who she is as a leader. And then with Jose, Jose Sanchez from, from Fletcher, he's going to get an opportunity that will not only help us, but it's going to help him, and that's what we're trying to do here. We are trying to make this a place that you can grow with us. I, I still laugh when people tell the stories. Well, I laugh not because it's funny. I laugh and wow, I can't believe that was ever said, that at one point in time, the message was here that if you wanted to promote, you needed to leave the district and then come back. You will never, ever hear us tell our best people to leave us for a minute. This is where you can grow. 
and be a part of things. And Jose's done a great job at the middle school. He has a really eclectic background, uh, but I'm excited about him working with not only Escondido, but also with, uh, also with Ohlone and, and getting to help and learn from a newer principal with Elsa, who's got a year under her belt, and on the other side, to get to work with Leslie, along with the rest of the team. I, I think this is a really exciting time for our district. And uh, yeah, I look around the room and I see, uh, gosh, almost everybody in this room, uh, we got to place either in the in the their current position or or help them get to a different place as part of growth. And I think that that is something that we should be celebrating. So that's it uh, for me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. N next, we have open forum, which Dr. Austin, I just want to clarify. At, at one point, we had flipped staff reports first. No? Or but they follow up in forum. I'm sorry. Um, yes, we moved them to the front. And I think this is... Uh, it's a little bit of a return to the way things were at one point in time. And, and our thought was, if I can just talk about the context for a second, no, the, the rationale, um, we would often have meetings where we would hear from people, we would touch a topic, and then we would not report on the things that were really the important work that we had before us in the district. So it, as an example tonight, uh, all three are important, but the Title IX and Every Student Reads, if those are at the end of the agenda, we were often cutting or shortening these things that are really important work. So that's why we we're trying to move it up again. And we maintained open forum prior to the reports because when I first started here, especially, there was a push to have a more consistent time for open forum. So that is why the order is the way it is. Again, not set in stone, but we're trying it tonight. Okay, we'll see how it goes tonight in agenda setting. We'll take it up after. Um, okay, then we're gonna go on to open forum. There are, uh, looks like about 20 speakers. So that will be a minute each. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go back to in-person Zoom alternating. I'm just gonna call them in order that y'all called in, except students first. Um, so we'll start with um, Matthew Gruppenhoff, then Ezra furtado Tuari, and then Benjamin Vakil. Okay, so I'm concerned about the current safety systems installed in schools because right now most schools in PAUSD have these painfully loud fire alarms that just repeatedly beep and I've seen these things tend to have negative effects on people's mental health and they sometimes cause some bad behavior during an evacuation like throwing stuff onto the roof and there's another issue that actually came up recently at Gunn where we had some weather emergencies and the admins couldn't make PA announcements because the power went out. And if there was, if they used a voice system that uses the fire alarm wires, then they could possibly make announcements that way. And I think it's important to install a voice system, a voice fire system in all of the PAUSD schools and all the older buildings in order to promote mental health and allow these emergency announcements to be made. Thank you. Um, Ezra, Benjamin, and then, oh, and then Stephen Davis. And we're done with students. Hi, everyone. Um, considering the recent communication about math-related issues in the district, uh, we think that a committee formed by students, staff, and administrators would be beneficial. This group would allow each party to understand and take into account the opinions and concerns of the other parties without fear of miscommunication through large-scale announcements such as superintendents, updates, or minute-long board speeches. Additionally, we think that the vague communication that has been sent out around issues is insufficient and does not address the questions of many parties involved. Mr. Leftwich, who voiced concerns about MBC at the previous board meeting, initially believed that the MBC course being offered at Pali was an asynchronous course offered directly through Foothill, and that Pali was just allowing students to use a classroom after school to work together on the assignments from the class. Only after meeting with him was I able to clarify that an instructor would be coming to teach the class in person. If staff members, students, and parents are all misguided by the communication sent out, it cannot be the fault of the community's lack of resilience or lack of information. We hope that the district will stop blaming community members for misinterpreting their statements and will instead make them clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. 
Benjamin, Stephen Davis, Devin Ardeshna. Hey, at, uh, April 18th, at the April 18th board meeting, I called for the establishment of a committee to, quote, advise on PAUSD math policy that puts students first. I would like to thank uh, Ms. DeBrianza for helping us facilitate that discussion, or at least start to. However, there is still much, much more that needs to be done. So I am here to urge the board to action regarding math education, particularly the issue of multivariable calculus. It is true that there are very different opinions here between staff, students, and parents. Uh, and it is also true that we will, that it's gonna be very, very difficult to walk through these, but that shouldn't stop anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Davis, Devin Ardeshna, Mark Vincenzi. Good evening. Um, I have heard, as of course you all have, that there has been a uh, Office of Civil Rights complaint filed against the uh, district. And I've experienced one of these before. Uh, and I would make one request, which is that you have an independent person, persons do the investigation. Uh, unfortunately, I will say in the, my previous experience with this, uh, the uh, administrative regs, which you guys probably know all about much better than I do, uh, actually was very depressingly amb amb ambiguous as to uh, allowing people to investigate themselves, as it were. Uh, and um, uh, the importance of this, uh, regardless of the outcome, is that we uh, focus on community trust, and a key part of that should be in independence. Thank you. Thank you. Devin, Mark, Emily Lee. Uh, hello. Uh, as a PAUSD alum, I want to reiterate the usefulness of MVC and Linalch uh, in many STEM fields. Uh, take AI for an example, um, something that the district is very keen on. Uh, While well, these large models are trained using gradient information, and that is one of the key topics taught in multivariable calculus. So it makes total sense that kids want to take these courses because they can learn from a real instructor face-to-face -face versus having to go find these answers on YouTube. Uh, when the MVC offering at Pali was created 10 years ago by teachers like Judy Choi and the late Radu Toma, um, it was made for two reasons. One, to make the course more accessible, and two, to support students and help them pursue their learning. And so for several years, it was a mid-seventh period start class, which means that kids were able to go home at a reasonable time or go pursue their extracurriculars. So, you know, it's really disappointing to come back to PAUSD and hear that site leadership no longer feels the need to support these kids because to quote them, it's only a handful of students. You know, I was one of those kids and I felt supported when I was here and for that, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, <laughs> Emily Lee, Rowena Chu. There he is. Hi, Mark. I taught at Gunn for 15 years, and my name is Mark Vincenti. This district has two simultaneous crises, demoralized teachers and demoralized students. A few months ago, the CDC reported that a record high one in three teenage girls had seriously considered suicide. And half of Palo Alto's 900 teachers in their latest survey, survey declared their morale to be low or very low. And now the district will be adopting chatbots, foisting on our teachers another learning curve and more student plagiarism. In addition, our teachers must now receive extra training in how to de-escalate violent students and work with behavioral intervention coaches. Also, our teachers must learn to recognize fentanyl overdoses. Santa Clara County reports 135 fentanyl deaths in 2021. Finally, our teachers must rehearse shelter in place to anticipate active shooters, events for which teachers must consider sacrificing their lives. As a city that's already lost precious youth to great despair, we must take our you, situation seriously. Please send your comments to board at pusd.org. Emily Lee, Rowena, and Sunny Paul. According to the district, equity and wellness are key priorities. I'm here to ask Don Austin and the board to use these terms in a responsible way. How do we narrow the achievement gap? Do we do this by promoting a narrative that certain families are a vocal minority that impedes progress? Or do we address structural barriers to equity, such as a system that denies disabled students access to benefits that are available to non-disabled students? 
I think the answer is clear. Equity is tough work, and privileged people in power can benefit from listening to groups who've been underserved. I believe it will be difficult for the community to have respectful discussion on equity because of the divisive, misleading framing on this topic that I've seen from the superintendent and certain board members. Please listen to your community who are hurting and use the terms equity and wellness with integrity. Lastly, equity is not a zero-sum game where creating opportunities for some prevents others from success. It is possible to provide pathways and supports for different types of learners while tackling systemic equity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rowena, Sunny, and Rika Yamamoto. Hi, my name is Rowena Chu. I want to build on what Emily has said. Uh, we both came to speak about a similar issue, which is again the Ohlone Room 19 closure, which is the subject of a current OCR investigation, indeed a federal investigation. I'm here today because I want to advocate for choice. I really want to implore the board and the community in general to empower students with choice. I'm really moved by the high school math students who are here tonight to speak about their choice in better maths. And I want to argue that for a lonely room 19 um, parents, that they should also be allowed the choice to stay at Ohlone or to move elsewhere. Um, choice means that we can have a more equitable world. The world outside of Palo Alto is rich and diverse, and um, I, th I believe that true equity can be better achieved if we can give people choice across the spectrum. It gives them a richer, uh, more rainbow world because we are all um, we are we are all in ourselves diverse. We're many different colors. The people uh, I can't talk Thank about you, that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Good send words to to, to boardofpusd.org. Sunny Paul, Rika, uh, Helene Grossman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sunny, and uh, I wanted to take time to bring your attention to the choice programs ad hoc committee recommendations that were shared in the board meeting a couple of weeks back. Uh, there are about five pages, including one page for recommendation. In the charge statement, it states that prepare a summary report of each choice program, including historic enrollment numbers, representation, and measure of, measure of success. Identify strength and opportunities for each program. Uh, make uh, while reviewing the report, I did not find any summary report that is stated in your own uh, recommendation uh, in the report. There is no findings. There is no data how the committee reached the recommendation. There is, it's like a black box. There is nothing. It's just, uh, you know, last page has recommendations, how they reached it, how it was reached. There is no this thing. And I understand it pretty senior folks in the board as well as school principals made this committee report. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, you know. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Rika, Helene, uh, Edith Cohn. Hi, everyone. PAC has surfaced 10 years of inclusion. To address the recent problem and continue robust inclusion, CAC recommend the district of complacency one, positive and safe school environment for all. Two, training and support all district and school personnel. Three, student support and access to screening and intervention. Under the Individual with Disability Education Act, behavior is one of the special factors when developing a child IEP, specifically the use of positive behavior intervention and support for any child with a disability. Incidents of child misbehavior and classroom disruption may indicate that the child IEP needs to include appropriate behavior support. The procedure requirement for discipline by IDA differs from non-IDA eligible students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Helene, then Edith, and then Stephanie Ackers Wright. You know what? Ms. Grossman spoke at the last item, so maybe that's if she's not here. So you know what, I'll leave it, I'll come back to it just in case. Um, Edith Cohen, Stephanie Akers Wright, Stacey Ashland. Hey, hi everyone. Yep. So after an ever shifting narrative of misrepresentation and lies involving the cancellation of M multivariable calculus as a district course, after explicit promises made that we would if we only could, but the CD doesn't let us, and it's best to offer it during school hours, the final narrative emerged as well, we can, but we won't. This was hinted on social media by the board president, and then the Gun high school leadership team, four of them spelled it out, 
spelled out a belief that allowing advanced math students to learn during school hours make it harder for others with other privileges to get into top colleges. In the height of hypocrisy, the word wellness was uttered in the context of forcing students to choose between extracurriculars and learning the core subject. The word equity is uttered because due to false policies by choice, in divergence from neighboring districts, advanced math is only accessible to students that learn on their own after school. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Ackers Wright, Stacy Ashlin, Lars Johnson. Is that on? I don't know that that's on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My own. Check. No. Oh. Okay. Hello. Can I have? Hello. Okay. Can we reset her to a minute? Well, let me know when. Great. Okay. Go ahead. As a parent of a special needs child in the district, I am deeply concerned about the incident at JLS and the subsequent conversations about behavioral interventions in the district. I would like to direct the attention of the board to the work of Dr. Ross Green, developer of the evidence-based collaborative and proactive solutions model, which provides us with a framework for understanding and supporting kids with challenging behaviors. This model is an effective form of behavioral reform. It is time we bring this model into our schools. When children exhibit explosive behaviors, research tells tells us it is because they are lacking the skills to be able to do better. This model is proven to be successful in helping the children and the adults that care for them to develop the skills to solve problems proactively and prevent challenging behavior. More information is freely available at livesinthebalance.org. When we are not proactive, the costs can be devastating. Prevention saves lives. Let's provide our teachers with the tools they need to keep our schools safe by implementing implementing the collaborative and proactive solutions model. Thank you. Uh, Stacy, Lars, Christina Schmidt. Thank you. My name is Stacy Ashland, and I'm the parent of two uh, students who attended Palo Alto Unified. My son all the way from age three to graduation, and my daughter from kinder through graduation. Um, my students graduated in 2017 and 2020. My son was on an IEP starting at age three years old, and I was actively involved in the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education for 15 years. The topic I'm talking about tonight is the closure and relocation of two special ed classrooms from Maloney and Escondido to Nixon and Barron Park. I've seen great progress in my years in this district, 18 years, especially regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm incredibly pleased under the leadership of Superintendent Austin and the boards the, to see the adoption of the SWIFT framework to measure progress in closing the achievement gap. As, uh, this relates particularly to students of color. And if you're not familiar, students of color are disproportionately represented in special education. Um, in addition, getting us through the pandemic is immense. <laughs> so that alone is, is incredible what you guys have been through in the past couple of years. Your uh, time is up, Ms. Ashland. Can you send us an email with yes. the rest of your comments? Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Lars, Christina, Jennifer Canerva. Good evening, dear board members. Good evening, dear board members. School is out for summer. And what a year it's been. Just one more thing. You get to score the district leadership on how they have done in advancing the best interests of our children. And when you do this, I would like to remind you that we have elected you as our board members to administer a public school district that looks after the most vulnerable children, provides a safe environment, an encouraging environment, and does not cave to special interests that are in the way of those goals. I really appreciate your service, and I hope you know what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Christina Schmidt, Jennifer Canerva, and then Arya Sufiani.
Is Christina on Zoom? Do you see her there? You can come back. Okay. She's there? Okay. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Good evening. I want to address the increasing negativity targeting our students with special needs. It is disheartening to witness the irresponsibility of those who propagate social media posts, exposing personal information, and speculating on removing children with special needs from our schools. This toxic dialogue is entirely unacceptable. Children with behavior issues deserve compassion and support. Schools are responsible for providing interventions, therapeutic support, and resources to address their needs. Teachers are responsible for understanding and implementing those interventions. We need IEPs that are implemented with fidelity, safety plans, parent education, and clear communication. Embracing a compassionate and empathetic approach towards children with special needs fosters empathy and the potential for positive change in their lives and in this community. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Jennifer Kinerva, uh, Arya Sufiani, and then um, Akshaya Ardaya. I'd like to share more thoughts on room 19. My child graduated from Maloney in room. Come close so we can hear. Okay. Yeah. Um, my child graduated from Maloney and room 19 last week where he started as a kindergartner. I was so proud watching him with his peers and I listened as the speakers praised the kids for the values they learned, how to be resilient, inclusive, how to advocate for themselves and others. Speaking about the room 19 closure to me is and will always be about doing the right thing, trying in every possible way to correct a systemic failure. This is simply and only about advocating that our children should be allowed to stay in the stable choice school where they have thrived and belong. It's all I've ever hoped for my child. Now, I know that progress isn't always linear and that it's often those who are most vulnerable who are forced to become advocates on their own behalf. But there are so few moments in life, whether you're a lawyer, an educator, or a researcher, where you can actually step up and right a wrong. Thanks to those who've stood with us. I couldn't be more grateful for your courage. Thank you. Arya, Akshaya, and Star Teach Out. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I'm a former employee of Palo Alto Unified, and um, Palo Alto Unified remains dear to my heart. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations, class of 2023. You made it. Um, I would really like Palo Alto Unified to really consider safety protocols and PBIS. I worked at other districts and I really understood how much PBIS makes a difference. And if possible, the district can consider implementing metal detectors or something to prevent and to keep the campuses safe. I think the kids really, students really deserve a safe campus. And I hope the district can collaborate with staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Akshaya, I think is in person, and then Star, and then um, Vaibhav, Vaish. Hello. Hi, board members. I'm here to uh, talk about some of the recent observations after the JLS incident, uh, which was very unfortunate. Um, like I said in the last board meeting, I have a child with a uh, disability, and I'm observing increased amount of uh, speculation, uninformed kind of behavior from parents. Um, you know, these autistic children or the children with disabilities, they grow up into autistic adults or adults with disabilities. Some of them have successful careers, but they all still remember comments made against them in the childhood. So let us not paint, let's be kind to each other. Let's not paint the whole community just because, you know, there was that one unfortunate incident. Some of us are still taking every day, one day at a time, and struggling to survive, trying to make our mark in this society, and let's be kind to one another, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Star Teach Out and Vibe. Good evening. Um, about five years ago, I sent a draft student survey in to the board to consider to try to expand student voice with respect to their courses. Um, and then about three years ago, I sent in a similar 
um, request having to do with implementing a 360 degree review process that um, included two articles, one from the Harvard Business Review, and one was about the effectiveness of this feedback in public schools. And I really would love for our board to seriously consider implementing this 360 degree review process, which allows everyone to review each other. And so everyone has a voice, our teachers, our, um, our administrators, our district office. I think we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, way above. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I just want to echo the comments uh, of Christina Schmidt and Akshay earlier. It's really sad to hear small but a disproportionately loud section in our own community seek segregation of special ed students after the incident at JLS. Um, and sad and heartbreaking though these comments are, in such a time, I'm just reminded of how fortunate we are to have all of you. And I want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to those who have supported, welcomed, and included students with special needs in Palo Alto. That includes you, our board trustees, our superintendent, our district leadership, our special ed department, our awesome staff, students, and community. Our children and families are blessed to have you. And when, when we hear toxic remarks, I will think of you with gratitude. Please don't go away. Please continue to do what you're doing. Our children and families need you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and lastly, I'll just try to see, is Helene Grossman here wanting to speak? Or was that for the other item? Okay. All right. That is the end of open forum. And now we're going to try this different thing and go right into staff reports. So Dr. Austin for the Title IX report. Mr. Bahadur Singh is going to introduce this item. Uh, Yes, thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, this evening, Mr. Robert Andrade is here tonight to provide the annual update on Title IX. And as he comes to the podium, I just want to take a quick minute to recognize the efforts he has performed this past year. Um, special thanks not only on behalf of students, families, but the staff who's been a great resource and really moved the needle on our efforts for Title IX. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so good evening, board members, district administration, and Dr. Austin. Can you hear me? Okay, let me, let me, let me try this again. Okay. Um, good morning, board members. Good, good evening, board members, Dr. Austin and, and district administration. It's my pleasure as your Title IX coordinator to speak to you in regards to our Title IX update for the rest of the year. Now, I'm going to do something a little different here because every month you receive the Title IX update, which includes what kind of cases we get, our case total, and how many cases we've resolved and what is open. I'm going to pivot here because I don't think we spend enough time to really discuss what has our approach been. And what do we actually do when a Title IX report comes in? So let me focus on these three things. Um, when I started this position three years, or, or this past year, I, I recognized that there was three areas that we needed to focus on. And part of my goal was to kind of take Dr. Dr. Austin's approach in trying to understand how can we simplify what these issues are and focus really hard on them to make them better for our community and our students and our staff. And what I recognized was that we had issues with accessibility and awareness. We had issues with administrative response and support. And we had issues with being student-centered and student-driven. You know, students are the ones who are affected in this process the most, yet they don't have a place or a role other than just being the survivor or the victim or the individual with trauma. So let me start off with accessibility and awareness. Part of what we have is our UCP form. Initially, our form was pretty old, outdated, and cumbersome. And something that we recognize is that when you're going to fill out this form, you, in fact, are coming from a place of trauma. After a year's worth of research and gathering every single complaint form from every single school district in the state of California, I present to you that at the beginning of this year, we made the most comprehensive form as one way for us to reduce the amount of trauma in which 
our, our families and students come to us to report something that's important or something that they've experienced in a negative way. We've revamped that form completely to be more user friendly and we've made it accessible both physically at each of our school sites and digitally on our website. As you can see, there's a copy of the form there and there's a QR code so you can access that digitally. On top of that, we didn't have a cohesive way to report what was going on in any form of misconduct for students. We had a, a different form for uh, anonymous reports, we had a different form for administrators, and we had a different form for students and, and, and teachers. And so what we wanted to do was bring it all together in one place. There's one reporting form for all students, parents, teachers, and staff, and administrators. And not only can you report in that one form, you can do it anonymously as well. Now bringing one place for everyone to come to us for. On top of increasing accessibility and awareness was my duties and obligations of taking a 700 page or 700 plus page law and summarizing it to families so that they can understand it as they navigate through their trauma. And so in doing so in my work here, the focus has been to really capture what's going on in the Title IX process and trying to engage with our students who learn differently. Some of us are visual learners. Some of you are visual learners. I myself am a visual learner. So being able to navigate through a process in which you can see what steps are next and sitting with parents and students to be able to teach them what is next and what you can expect has been our focus. So we've created resources to really guide both anyone who's going through this process, whether you be a student, a family, or a staff member. Now the next thing I wanna focus on is our administrative response and support. In many situations, our administrators and our principals are the first line of response when a student has experienced some negative impact or some highly traumatic event. And in, in what I've learned is it's important to empower our principals so they know what exactly tools they have at their disposal to address a situation that is really urgent and in dire need of assistance. So we started off by being able to support administrators by teaching them what can you do to stop, prevent, or address the effects of alleged negative misconduct and understanding what tools you have. So some examples that we've really taught our administrators this year is engaging in no contact directives, showing you that you can engage in different ways to increase supervision on campus to promote the safety of students. You can modify class schedules so that students um, don't come into contact with one another. You can place students in separate classes when they're experiencing high levels and forms of bullying. And you can transfer students who are taught to a class taught by a different teacher if the complaint is about a teacher affecting a student in a negative way. And not only are we in, in empowering our our principals and our administrators to know what measures they can take, but also to address the mental health component and the support that we need to provide students because just taking those measures alone is not enough. We have to be able to consider what a person, a survivor, a victim of any form of harassment or discrimination um, wants in terms of support. And so we provide them with the opportunity to engage in that by restoring some sense of agency. We go over with principals and, and individuals, what mental health access do you have? We go over what sort of wellness support you can get by going to a safe space such as the wellness center on your campus. And lastly, we address concepts of academic support because we recognize at the end of the day, if you're experiencing trauma, you're not gonna be a normal student in the classroom you're not gonna be able to focus on your tests. You're not gonna be able to focus on your exam. You're not gonna be able to focus on the assignments that you need. So what can we do to provide you support so that you can have a seamless experience, at least at school? Our ultimate goal is to minimize the burden on the individual who is the target of the alleged harassment, and that's taking a trauma-informed approach. In the past, we didn't have this, because what was happening was we were asking students what happened during their negative experience, but we weren't asking them how they felt. And so now the purpose of what we try to do here is putting students at the center of understanding and what happened at kind of the back. You know, when I meet with students, I wanna know who you are. I wanna know what your dreams and aspirations are. I wanna know who you are as a student at PAUSD, and then we can discuss what happened. And in that situation, it's about restoring some sense of humanity to the students that we have as they navigate through trauma. Now, the last thing I wanna focus on is being student-centered and student-driven. 
This is something where students did not feel a part of. And so my focus has been to, one, get as much feedback as possible, but also channeling all of the student input that we have and advocacy into process participation. Meaning that was me going to different school sites, talking to students, teaching them what's going on, but also showing them that this is what the process is. If you don't like it, work with me through it so we can find where these problems are. The other portion of that is creating resources for students by students. It's one thing to take into account a 700 plus page law. It's another thing to teach that to students and then have them re-summarize that information in a manner in which their peers can understand. And as you can see in that poster there, that is a student created poster by students at Gunn High School, um, who I will recognize here today in terms of the work that they've done and seeing how they're able to convey that information over to you know, us as a district. On top of that, that's allowed me to develop interpersonal connections with students affected by misconduct and also continue building more. Now lastly, let me talk about the Title IX Student Advisory Board. This is a year long commitment where students have engaged in monthly seminars with me to understand Title IX from the beginning. Whether it's own conception, it's role in American jurisprudence and the whole ins and outs of that concept as a whole. Students dedicated their time and efforts to meet with me and grapple with this idea and I have to really commend them because what they accomplished was as difficult as a first year law course. They understood burden shifting, they understood civil procedure, they understood preponderance of the evidence and different standards that many students might not be able to grasp and they were able to tackle it head on. So not only did they learn about district procedures in a comprehensive and in-depth manner, but they also raised awareness on their campus and district wide. So as I conclude here tonight in my presentation to you, it is actually with great honor for me to be able to recognize six students from Gunn High School for their efforts and what they have done in advancing Title IX initiatives thus far. And so with that, I would like to recognize these students. For those of you who have come in here today, um, please, you know, after I call your name, please come to the front. I'd like to recognize Ravina Nath, Annabelle. <laughs> Annabelle Honigstein, who's not able to make it. <laughs> Elizabeth Jackson, who's also not here today. <laughs> Lauren Kane. <laughs> Zoe Leontis, who also could not make it. And, and lastly, Sophia Turian. So if we could give them all. Um, there's, there's no way I could have done this alone. And so having their support throughout this entire year is something exciting to know that we can continue this on for the years to come. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it, was a, it was a really lovely presentation. <laughs> um, we've got some community comments, and then I'm sure board members have some questions and comments. Um, so let's start with um, Sara Woodham and then Alex Toftik. Hi. Um, where did Robert go? I don't know. Get close to the mic, and Robert's over Sorry. there. Oh, there. <laughs> okay, hi. Okay. Um, thank you very much for all the work that you've um, done with respect to this Title IX complaint procedure. And, um, I, you know, I looked through it, and I guess I wanted to make a point just on the, the awareness and accessibility piece, because one of the things that's come out is that, uh, just that I've seen in the last week, is that there's a lot of confusion over Title IX versus UCP. And so that's the point I really wanted to make because I, even as I, you know, I love the flowchart. I'm a visual person too. So having that flowchart is great. I feel like, I mean, I know this was a Title IX report and even then I wasn't clear whether or not this was supposed to be a Title IX report or Title IX with UCP embedded or the whole thing because you talked about one streamlined process. But like, I've, it feels like there should also be like a, a UCP 
um, version of that flowchart um, because Title IX, just most people are fairly familiar and it's gender harassment by gender and things that are discrimination, whether or not by race or uh, race, ethnicity, abilities, should also be specifically, I think, laid out in a similar manner, even if the complaint procedure, the complaint process is, is like 90% the same, which it should be, and I, I think the work you're doing there looks really great. And, um, and I guess, you know, you said that it was available in all the, the offices, but if folks don't know what they don't know, and they don't even know it exists. The fact that it's sitting on a shelf somewhere is a little irrelevant. So I feel like the district should actually push this out like twice a year on a regular basis, not right at the beginning of the year because that's when everybody gets totally overwhelmed, but like October-ish <laughs> when stuff starts to get a little more real. Um, you push it out. Thank you, Ms. Photo. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, Alex Tucker. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Tadic, and uh, my family was involved in a Title IX incident at Gun two years ago. It was a pretty big one, involved six kids on, on one side and many others on the other side. And uh, we, I have experience with all the, all the suggestions that were listed on the slide there were implemented for my family. Unfortunately, that never resulted in harassment stopping. So we ended up in a tort claim with District of Palo Alto, which was eventually resolved to anyone's happiness. But uh, so what I wanted to say is that slide goes far, but the, I would love for that to be a way for, you know, for the harassment to actually stop and to say what happens if it doesn't stop? How do you make, you know, because uh, if the, your student is continuously harassed, the mental health and all the, all those things you know, he, they're just not never going to be happy or be able to attend the school. My, the conclusion of my incident was that the kids got transferred to a different school where they're driving. And that was the end of it. So uh, if anybody would like to talk about what it's like to be on the other side, I think this was the biggest Title IX incident that year. I would be happy to share my insight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, those are all of our community comments. Let me just make sure. Okay, yes, those are all my community comments. So, uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for Robert? Or okay, sure. Where's Robert? There we go. Probably yeah, you can you can come on. <laughs> you never know. I'm not gonna grill you. <laughs> I I really appreciated the presentation and the report. Um, you know, we as a board have been very focused on Title IX for a number of years, and as a district have been focused on it for since 2016 or so, um, when we had occasion to really reevaluate how the district was handling Title IX. Um, and so having been involved in the process and especially focusing on accessibility for students, that was something over the last couple of years we've really tried to focus on, uh, making sure students are involved, that they understand the process, because once we got past the initial, you know, first five or six years of sort of making sure that we had the processes set up and continuing to improve them, I think the second most important thing is making sure students know how to avail themselves of the process and feel comfortable doing it. What I appreciated about your presentation was that it focused on that. When the Trump administration had the Title IX regulation changes, um, Ken Dauber and I were on the BPRC and we, had, we were discussing how exactly we were to incorporate those, or rather how we were to comply with the change in the law while also maintaining what this board had expressed was a, a very clear goal of minimizing the burden on survivors and protecting survivors. Because as some folks may not know, when the regulations were being changed, there was an elevation of um, the interest to the, uh, to the respondent. Um, including certain rights that, that hadn't existed before. And, and the, the, the fear was, and what happened in other districts throughout the country, was that there would be a chilling effect on complainants. So I very much appreciate the focus that you've, you've placed on bringing students into the fold, on minimizing the, the burden on complainants. 
I say that as a board member, I say that as a litigator who represents survivors of sexual abuse against institutions, including public education institutions. Um, and so, you know, the follow-up is always the key. I really do enjoy, not enjoy, but I really do pay attention to the, the, the Title IX reports we get. Because to me, this is fantastic. And then, of course, the proof is in how we're, we're you know, executing and how, what we're doing with the complaints that come in and the numbers, you know, month after month. So um, all that to say, I thank you. This is great. And um, just to, to add one more thing, the point that the gentleman raised about, uh, you know, follow-up and, and I think to me also, you know, educating folks on the remedies, which is, it's in your presentation, but that was an area that we had a particular gap in over the last several years, which was, sure, we can, we can tell people how to get involved. We can make them feel comfortable and make sure they are comfortable in, in making reports and knowing what to do next. What happens once the remedy is put into place? And you know, what are the next six steps you know, if this happens and if this doesn't happen, if this doesn't happen? And I know that that's a discussion that um, you know, is encouraged to have with, with the complainants and, and the individual involved. But um, it's just an area that I would emphasize a continuing focus on um, because, as you heard, I, I know I think that's an area that sometimes can fall a little bit uh, deprioritized to the initial bringing the, the complainants in and guiding them through the process until a resolution is reached. But of course, the post-resolution remedies and, and consequences are also equally important. So uh, yeah, I very much appreciated the presentation and uh, I'm glad to see you at the helm of, of Title IX. Thank you. I just have a couple quick things. One, I, I believe you said, and I just want to confirm this is correct, that this, these, maybe not these particular students, I don't know what year of school you are, but the student advisory board is something that's going to continue. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so there's going to always be a place where there's a mechanism for students to continue to provide input into the process, what's working, what's not working, what students still are having trouble wrapping their heads around, what could be improved, all yeah, of that. There's always going to be a place for them. All right, good, great. Um, and then I guess following up on that, how to this point about stuff sitting on a shelf in an office, how is this information communicated to students in particular? Um, it, it varies from school site to school site, but generally our approach is, depending on who is the administrator on point for Title IX or UCP issues, um, the administrator, once they've received the report, whether it be from a student or a teacher, they offer the UCP form either physically or virtually through email. Um, and usually when it's offered via email, um, that's including their parents who are in, in the email as well and also my contact information where I'm CC'd. So if a family ever wants to file a complaint or a report, they're provided that digitally and then sometimes physically. But most importantly, they're provided with my contact information where they can engage it. Is there any sort of broader education though before, before I understand that if somebody complains of something, then, then this starts this process. But is there any education sort of proactively before that step, sort of letting, if you've experienced any of these things, here, there's, a, there's an avenue for you. Is there, are we doing that? I mean, I, I know we have to, yeah. Again, I think this is something kind of varies from school site to school site because students usually contact me in terms of when they want me to be present at certain events. Okay. Yeah. And at least I can use gun as an example this year. Um, they had me talk at their denim day where I had a, a packed wellness center full of students where I was able to go through all of this information. I also show up to student health fairs that are available um, throughout the year. And then I also meet with counselors and, and individuals because sometimes students will report these to their counselors. They haven't gone to the administrator just yet, but sometimes well, counselors will have me present in this meeting so I can walk students through this process as well. Most of the time, it, it's, it's me discussing with families like, if you file a complaint, this is what can happen. If you don't file a complaint, this is also what we're still going to keep doing to support you. Um, the, ultimately, it's just providing students with the understanding of what opportunities you have available to you. Because some students ultimately, at the end of the day, just want the conduct to stop. And something f formulaic like a formal investigation might not be the best approach for them, or something like an informal resolution might not be the best approach. So really, what I do in such situations to educate students is I meet with them personally and individually. 
um, where I can at least give them as much options as they have available to them, which I think that might be more necessary in every particular case being different, and then walking them through each and every one. I do this with families at the elementary school level, and for students at the high school level, I meet with them individually. And, and so far, I've found it to be pretty successful. Thank you. Ms. Rosado. First, I wanted to thank you and staff and all the students for your hard work and focus on this very important issue. I was um, really impressed with your presentation and by the student engagement um, and the focus of minimizing the burden on the individual who was the target of the alleged harassment. I was very pleased that that was clearly stated. Um, the, last fall, I had listening groups of middle school students and high school students, and a lot of them reported that they didn't know what to do if something happened. And so, kind of echoing what other people have said, having a proactive approach, if this isn't already happening, um, maybe having that, the visual in each classroom to ensure that it's not site-based in terms of which schools are getting some information, um, I think would be really helpful. I was wondering, um, I would love to see year to year kind of reporting for each site, because we, we get a report that shows, um, but just so that we can kind of compare and see how we're doing. Um, is there also a student advisory board at Pali is one of my questions. So the student advisory board is open to all high school students. Okay. Yeah. So it just happened that this year it was? Primarily gun for primarily this Primarily gun. Yeah. Okay, so it's open to both. Um, and then, um, yeah, basically proactively sharing this before um, someone needs to file it, I think would be great. So thinking about how to proactively reach out to each and every school, to each and every family through email and through the visuals, I think would be fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really helpful. Um, might I add something there? And I, I recognize that everyone wants to know and see more access again. And the focus is that that poster that I showed is actually going to be posted at every single secondary site and every single restroom and every single locker room and also, yeah, in, in, in every everything. So it's going to be everywhere moving okay, forward. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, so thank you so much. I've just got a, a few questions or, or thoughts. Um, one being, I'm wondering about how parents are, I'm thinking especially younger kids, right? How parents are commuted such, communicated these things, um, and more specifically a UCP, right? If, if I'm, so if they're up in schools, um, but a parent is concerned about something and they don't know about this process, um, you don't have to have an answer for this now, but I do think I'm hearing a bunch of us say, hey, let's think about how we're making sure all families in the district know if something happens that violates either Title IX or, or you know, rises to the level of UCP, that they know, you know, what action they can take. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to, because I've had a lot of community members ask me that this, and I and I realize that I think I'm clear on it, but maybe I'm not. Um, you are a Title IX coordinator. I Does every Title IX complaint come through you, or are some handled at the site? So. Every Title IX complaint is something that I'm notified. Um, there are some Title IX complaints that are resolved at the site because they do not rise to the level of Title IX. And what I usually tell administrators in that sense is it's Title IX related, but it's not Title IX violation. Um, and in, in that situation, I usually speak with our administrators to discuss what is the conduct that happened and then what can we do to solve it at the site if it hasn't resulted in something along the lines of a sexual assault or any form of touching. Um, that's not to say that we don't address every single um, report at my office. Most of the time, it's just guidance. It's just guidance. Sometimes we have cases that, that are elementary school students playing butt tag. And in many situations, that not, might, might not be something that rises to the level of Title IX because there's no malintent and there's no touching for any sort of sexual gratification. But that doesn't mean we just let it go. We have to address it and approach it in a restorative way for some of our students so that they recognize that this behavior is not okay. And then also reinforcing that over and over again because um, this is a behavior that was taught and we have to address how to unteach this type of behavior. Thank you. And I guess I have a similar question for a UCP. You deal with some UCPs as well that aren't Title IX. Yes. Right. But some are handled at the site. Yeah. And how is that determined? What is what happens at the site and what comes to you? 
uh, what comes to me is, is conduct based on a protected status or class. And the next portion of what comes next is, is the, the conduct that a student experience severe, persistent, or pervasive? If the conduct hasn't usually risen to that level, in many regards, California law requires me to dismiss those complaints. But that is not satisfactory to my approach. Um, that's where we kind of bring the site in because that's when the site needs to address the underlying behavior, whether it be racism, sexism, misogyny, any sort of type of behavior with which a student has engaged in. So even though a complaint might not rise to the legal thresholds that we have, we still address that basically with our principals and our staff because at the end of the day, our focus is that our students can be normal kids in the classroom, not students who are just known for their trauma. Um, thank you. Oh gosh, I had one more question about our UCP. Oh, I know. You said that some people are just interested in sort of resolving it informally. They don't want to go through the whole process. We still document those, that those happened, right? Like we're keeping track, when we keep track, yeah. even if it goes through an informal process, it still sort of counts as something we dealt with, investigated, remedied, yes? Yes, and in many situations, the informal resolution operates as a sort of mediation where I sit two students in separate rooms and I ask one student how they feel and how this affected them, and then I go to the next room and I ask the student, do you understand how this affected this other student and where do you think? Do you have any feelings of remorse? How do you want to get there? And I go back and forth between the students and ask them until they're able to come into the room together and kind of work out their differences. So in situations for pain, pertaining to bullying, for example, this might work. In situations pertaining to sexual assault and harassment, this is kind of a no-go. No student who's been a victim or a survivor of any of those situations wants to be in the same room with a student who's affected them in a negative way. So it is fluid. I think our ultimate purpose is to take a fluid approach. And, you know, what is the best opportunity for students to get through this process? Okay, thank you. Um, I think my last question. Um, if, if a family is offered a UCP, I wonder if we have, or title, you know, if we have sort of that flow chart that can go along with it, because I think often, even if we make the offer of a UCP, some people don't know what that is. And I wanna make sure that, and maybe we will resolve that by putting it in bathrooms and sending it home to parents and, and whatnot. Um, but just making sure that if you aren't in the weeds in the district at all, you might have no idea what that is. Um, I'm so glad to see your, the student advisory group and that so many are from Gunn, because I know a few years ago we had that Pally Rise Task Force and we, there was an interest in making sure we had gone involved. Um, we'd love to see more gender diversity on that group if you can get more people interested. Um, but uh, thank you so much. I mean, I think it's great work and um, I feel confident we are, we are headed in a really good direction. Anything else, colleagues? Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next we've got Every Student Reads. We, we are a clapping bunch tonight. We are like, I love it. Maybe on this one too. So, well, we, be we better clap on this one. <laughs> My gosh, we should just start with applause on this one. Um, before, before I turn this over to Ms. Brown, just a last comment. First of all, we're not sure that uh, Robert's title is what it needs to be any longer because, because, because it's called Title IX Coordinator, it'd be easy to not know that he handles UCPs. Uh, next on our website, if you just put in the word complaint, the page comes up with everything we just talked about, UCP, Title IX, complaints against uh, employees, special education, it all comes up. So it's there, so we're, we're doing a good job there. And the last comment for Robert, and so many people do great jobs here, Robert's impact is about as significant as you can get in a first year. It, it, is, it is a different world. In, in that office and the work that they do. So thank you again, Robert. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ms. Brown to talk about something that should have a two hour presentation and a headline in both newspapers, hint to both newspapers uh, <laughs> tomorrow because what she is about to share is unprecedented, unparalleled in the state and I just don't think is getting the attention it deserves. Uh, for everyone involved. So with that, you guys better have a heck of a presentation. Yeah, so, after that Ms. Brown, go ahead. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Austin. <laughs> Tonight we're sharing the end of the year results for the second year of the Every Student Reads Initiative, specifically for progress indicator number three. But before I turn it over to Ms. Reynolds, I just want to thank the teachers and principals for their tremendous work this year. It was a rough year implementing new curriculum and a new assessment tool with the, um, at the support tool that came with it, and we are just extremely proud and uh, want to just acknowledge that they rose, our educators rose to the occasion and have knocked it out of the park. And uh, we are making a significant difference for our most vulnerable students. So as a reminder, progress indicator one and two results will be presented in the fall after we have our CAST results. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Good evening, board members. I'm so glad so many people came to see this presentation. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Elementary Educational Services has completed the second year of the Every Student Reads Initiative, implementation focusing on increasing the reading proficiency of the following historically underserved groups you can see on this slide. We are proud of the effort our students continue to put into their reading. Being literate is transformative. Instructional practice implemented by dedicated and highly trained, trained educators matters as evidenced by our reading results. Our Every Student Reads Initiative ESRI groups have grown since the middle of the year when all children exceeded the progress indicator three end of year goal. And our end of year results in the second to the last column provide the percentage of students um, within each ESRI group reading on or above grade level. Our students are responding to instruction as the reading proficiency of ESRI groups has increased by 19 to 37 percentage points since the beginning of the year. That's what I'm talking about, all right. This graph includes the number of children within the identified ESRI groups at each proficiency level. Asian white and all students K through five are also included. It informs our work in meeting the PAUSD promise goal of all students reading on or above grade level by the end of third grade. The following slides illustrate changes in reading proficiency from the beginning of year to the end of year for each ESRI group. It demonstrates the number of students reading above or on grade level, one grade level below, two grade levels below, or three or more grade levels below, which are the end of year standards. African American students, 80% of African American students are reading on or above grade level, a 33 percentage point increase from the beginning of year. Eighty percent. Fifty-six percent of Pacific Islander students are reading on or above grade level, a 29 percentage point increase from the beginning of year. Unprecedented results, I believe Dr. Austin said. This is exceptional superintendent leadership. Sixty-five percent, sixty-five percent of Hispanic or Latino students are reading above grade level, which is a 36 percentage point increase. <laughs> socioeconomically disadvantaged students, 63% of our socioeconomically disadvantaged students are now proficient readers with a 30 percentage point increase. 49% of our Hispanic or Latino socioeconomically disadvantaged students read on or above grade level. These students also saw a 30 percentage point growth from the beginning of year. Sixty-three percent of students with disabilities are meeting the end of year proficiency. They are reading on or above grade level. 63%, that's a 19 percentage point increase from the beginning of the year. 
66% of our English learners are reading on or above grade level, increasing 37 percentage points from fall to spring. All ESRI groups have combined 71% of the students in ESRI are now reading on or above grade level, 71% K through five. Ms. Conaway, our Assistant Superintendent of Equity and Student Affairs, will share with you the SWIFT focus group results. Thank you, Danae. Um, what's great is that the iReady diagnostic reading data allows us a welcomed opportunity to take a look at an additional metric that has not been included in our SWIFT plan. So this allows us to take that focus group and identify how they're specifically doing um, under the reading initiative. And like you saw with the rest of the groups, we're seeing some really great data there. So um, at the year start, 273 students, or so 40% of the focus group uh, was at or above reading grade level. This increased to 62% by mid-year, and by end of year, 77%. So this is very consistent with a greater than 30% um, incre um, increase rate that we've seen with our other subgroups, with a total of 37% increase overall from beginning of year to end of year. So we're very proud of that. Here you can see the results for all students in Palo Alto Unified, and 87% of all students K through five are reading on or above grade level. Our teachers and students are working hard. I know you're really interested in looking at the students by grade level, so we have included this for you. Um, and you can see here that this graph includes the proficiency by grade level within each tier. And what we want to make sure is as our students increase in grade level, we know that the grade level content um, will increase. And so it's important that our teachers are equipped with the latest research in reading and in pedagogy to make sure that students are able to access more complex text structures and reading information that they may not be necessarily familiar with or have that vocabulary. And so we're excited that our fourth and fifth grade teachers are taking the IMSC Orton-Gillingham morphology training this spring and also um, in the fall. And we'll be implementing that in grades four and five next school year. So all K-5 students will have um, phonics or um, morphology instruction across all grade levels in PAUSD. And I know you're also interested, well, what if kids that are ESRI attend PAUSD in fall, winter, and spring? What did those students look like, Danae? Because we know we have kids that come and go. So we have that data for you as well. So 91% of our kindergartners that are in ESRI that were in PAUSD are on or above grade level. 77% of our first graders are on or above grade level, and 73% of our second graders are on or above grade level. And then for our students who attended in grades three through five, ESRI students, 81% of third graders are on or above grade level, 59% of fourth grade, and 62% of fifth graders are on or above grade level. And what we really appreciate about the iReady assessment is that it gives teachers individual student data that shows student strengths and specific areas for um, teachers to really hone in on regarding the different domains. And we're looking at fourth grade in terms of where we want to focus next year around vocabulary and reading comprehension specifically around informational text. Our partners at Curriculum Associates provide the next three slides for us. And here you can see the growth by grade and reading proficiency for all PAUSD students in grades K through five. And we're really excited to see that the students that we know need to make the most progress are actually making the most growth. And that shows that the work we've been doing, really focusing on reading and providing outstanding professional learning for our teachers, 
our principals getting into classrooms, our elementary principal collaborative meeting together monthly. All of the work we focused on the last two years and will continue to work on next year is making a difference. And we're encouraged by this report to see that the students who need to make the most growth, children that are one or more years below grade level, are actually doing that. Um, and they're, they're moving closer to meeting the end of year standards and getting closer to grade level. And then here you can see how fabulous PAUSD schools are. Um, this slide reflects the median student performance and median percent of typical growth of PAUSD elementary schools from fall to spring. And yes, we are in the high performance, high growth quadrant again for the spring like we were mid-year because we're PAUSD, but you know. It's important to note that. And then this is what we look like K-5, just by grade level. Again, in the high performance, high growth quadrant, which our friends at Curriculum Associates like to remind us is unprecedented <laughs> and quite chart. amazing. <laughs> yeah, there are grade levels in schools off the chart, yeah. literally off the chart. So. Um, we can give it up to our teachers and our students and the Every Student Reads Initiative. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, one community comment, Nicole Chi Wong. Good evening, I just wanted to say congratulations to the district and to the staff and very importantly to the teachers and the aides that are in the classrooms doing this work and to the community for being so supportive of this priority. I, um, to what Dr. Austin said, I don't think it's getting as much coverage as it should and um, so congratulations. And I do wanna say that I think that this, if anything, points to having higher goals. I know when, as someone who does strategy and goal setting in my day-to-day -day job, it's hard to know where to set the goal in the beginning. And so 5% probably seemed like a lot at the time. And now we've seen we can blow 5% out of the water. So I think this is one of those Kennedy statements sending, putting a man on the moon. And so we should set really, really high goals because I think we've seen that with the right supports from everyone in our community, we can achieve those goals. And so I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Claps. I, feel, I feel like I want to implement like an always clap. <laughs> it's just nice. It feels different. Um, comments? Questions? Yeah, go ahead. No one else? I want to hear what Dr. Okay, okay, we'll go down this way. Gosh, pressure, Mr. Cohn. I haven't gotten that since school. Um, wow, that was great. I really, Danae, stand up, please. I mean, I just, and, I, and I know it's not just you. I mean, the you, you stand for an entire organization's worth of focus on this goal. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the things I really take away from this is, you know, we, we've got a lot of resources and capabilities here. And most importantly, we've got an unbelievable uh, faculty and staff. Um, and it shows that when you, when you organize your efforts and point them in, at something that's really important um, and really focus on the things that you need to change. And, and, you know, I mentioned, I think back in a few months ago, you shared sort of the list of all the things that had been done, which by the way, I've copied into a Google Doc and probably sent out to 100 people all over the state. I mean, because people are dying to find out what to do to achieve, I mean, that's even without knowing what these results are, they just wanna know what to do to improve. And I just think that, uh, you know, it, it just shows that when you've, when you've really created such a great organization and focused it so well and then taken to heart the charge to that you can change you need to change the things you need to change to achieve the results that you want to achieve I mean you get these kind of results I'm I, I I'm obsessed by the slide that how the, the growth vary across placement levels because the you know it, it's great that we make good growth or more than 100% growth at kids who are at or above already but the real challenge the real challenge and the reason we did all this is for kids who are two or three grades behind who are, you know, who have to go more than 100% a year to even have a hope of catching up. And we know in the vast majority of uh, venues across the, 
across the United States, across the world, those kids never catch up. Because the idea that they've fallen behind and now they'll grow more than 100% a year is like, you know, you can't, can't imagine it. So to look at these numbers, I mean, for kids three or more grades below, median growth was 248%. I mean, and then for kids who are two grades below, it was 170%. I mean, so, I mean, I, I don't even know how to process this. It's so, it's so amazing. So, I, and I, you know, my hat's off to our, uh, certainly our students first and foremost and their families because they're the ones who really uh, achieved, but our organization really made it possible so that they could do that. So, you know, congratulations. I really look forward to seeing what the SBAC results, the CAS uh, results are because, you know, obviously we changed the assessment from the last time. I, I'll point out, you know, I did the I did the comparison that you guys didn't do because you didn't because of the change of the assessment. I looked back and what the assessment was last year versus the end of year this year. And, you know, on average it was 15 or 16 percentage points higher this year than last year, which is, and that's after improving, you know, uh, uh, several points last year. So it's really, I mean, it's unprecedented stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm confident that when August rolls around and we're able to look at our SBAC results that we'll see something the same. So I, you know, I really, I, I'll, I'll go home very happy tonight and, and, uh, and probably have a drink to celebrate with my wife because uh, this, is, this is just great news for our, our students and for our district, so thank you. All right, well, I was at the district office a few months ago for a meeting and I ran into a parent in the hallway, um, not a friend, someone I knew only casually. And she stopped me because she wanted to thank me for the changes to our reading program. Her son was in third grade, I think, and she told me that until this year, he hated reading. It was a huge struggle for him. He was below grade level and he just hated it. He avoided it because he was bad at it. But this year, she said everything for him changed. He blossomed, he made huge improvements, and now he loves to read. She says he's walking around with the house with a book all the time. So after she told me this, I ran into Ms. Reynolds' office and I grabbed her out and I had her come in here and accept the praise herself because I certainly wasn't the one who deserved it. Um, but what I love about the story is that this woman's son was not in one of the Every Student Reads Initiative focus groups. Uh, the headline of these results that we saw today was 19 to 37% increases, um, which drastically surpasses even our wildest hopes, as I think it's very clear from all of us tonight. Um, but the benefits of the initiative did not come at the expense of other students, of higher achieving students, but rather extended to all students. Um, and that's kind of the point I wanna make. You know, our school district, it's like an ecosystem. Our students sit in the same classrooms, they're taught the same curriculum by the same teachers, they play on the same playgrounds, they attend the same assemblies, they sing in the same choirs. And for decades, our black Pacific Islander, Latino students, socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and our students with disabilities have been kind of like the canaries in the coal mine, warning us that our ecosystem needs attention, that it's not as healthy as it should be. And when we talk about equity, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about healing the ecosystem. We're talking about making changes that enable all of our kids to thrive because they aren't right now. If they were, we wouldn't need the Every Student Reads initiative for either the students in the focus groups or for the children like the son of the mom who stopped me in the hall. And we also wouldn't need to invest tens of millions of dollars annually on mental health and wellness to support students, many of whom are succeeding academically but suffering emotionally. Later in this meeting, staff is gonna present us with an annual budget of over $300 million. And 85% of this money is spent on salaries and benefits for teachers and classified staff, principals and administrators. All of the adults that are responsible for educating all PAUSD students, which is both our legal responsibility and our mission as a K through 12 school district. 
And if student outcomes are our measure, as they should be, then for decades, I would argue, we have not fulfilled this mission. And I would argue that means we haven't been responsible stewards of all that money. Because we have created and perpetuated an educational system where hundreds of millions of dollars that's supposed to be spent on all students has instead educated only some of them effectively. $300 million, but at the beginning of this school year, only 47% of African American third graders were reading at or above grade level, and the numbers were even worse for Pacific Islander, Latino, socioeconomically disadvantaged, and students with disabilities. And in addition to not being taught to read, these children also have been subjected to othering, microaggressions, and blatant racism in our schools. To me, it seems safe to say that these students are not getting their fair share of the $300 million we are spending. And if I were their parents, I would want my money back. But we can't give you your money back. But we can, and we should be held accountable for spending it more effectively. So we still have a very, very long way to go, but these results show us that we really are finally heading in the right direction. So I wanna thank you, Ms. Reynolds, and our teachers and our principals, and particularly our students, for all your work this year. And I wanna say that you have unequivocally called BS on all the decades old narratives that you, we have used to let the school district off the hook for not doing our job. Look at how we've improved education for all students with just this one initiative. Imagine what we can do if we continue on this path. Imagine if we double down, if we accept the canaries as truth tellers instead of suspending them and diagnosing them with learning disabilities at rates exponentially higher than their peers. And imagine if psychological safety was not just a term thrown around by adults, but the lived reality of all of our students. How much might they thrive? How might they upend all our expectations of what a public school can and should be? These results make me optimistic that we are actually on our way to finding out. So again, I wanna give a huge thank you to everyone involved in this initiative, and Dr. Austin, I think you're gonna to need to propose some new goals to us. <laughs> I'm not gonna belabor the point, although I could. <laughs> um, I'll say this. When I was talking to Dr. Austin earlier about these results, the first thing I said was, you know, there are times when it's really important for the board to exercise oversight, get, get in deep, ask good questions, shift the direction of things. Then there are times, like when I saw this report, where all I wanted to do was touch it as little as possible. Because it was like, I don't want to mess with the secret sauce. You know, I don't want to mess with the progress that's being done and put a finger on a scale that may shift things. Um, and it reminded me of this great, uh, Teddy Roosevelt quote about governance, which I think is, I mean, it's really important for me as a board member to remember this, this perspective, which is, you know, a good leader um, has the, the, you know, good sense to pick people who are good enough to execute his, his goals, but who has the restraint to stop himself from meddling in those people accomplishing those goals. And there are times when I think we as a board have meddled and that's had good results. This is a time when we ought not to meddle and only to say, <laughs> great work, you have executed the direction of the board. And uh, I guess that's the highest praise I could give anyone on staff. So thank you. And of course, high expectations for the future. Ms. Siegel. I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank staff, teachers, reading specialists, children, and families. This is incredible and significant gains. I am honored to be part of the school district and on this board to witness these gains. I printed, got it all printed out, and I kept looking. 
whoa, ever at each page. I'm like, oh, it just keeps getting better and better. And then I thought, maybe I'm not good at reading graphs because this is incredible, right? And then I checked and checked. So um, I'm echoing you know, what other people have said. I look forward to next year seeing the same assessment tool being used to be able to measure year-to-year -year progress. That's really exciting. I look forward to increasing the target goal for everyone because we have seen such significant gains in each and every group. And I just wanted to say a sincere thank you to you and to everyone involved. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo thank you to all of our teachers, our aides, our principals, our, our interventionists, our specialists. I mean, everyone who did this, I, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that a year ago, there was a lot of struggle. There were some staff that were super happy that we were going to take a different course. There were some staff that were very upset. Um, I was very upset that they were very upset. Um, and I think what it, what it came, and, and now here we are a year later with outstanding gains that just even a year ago, I never could have imagined. And obviously let's acknowledge we're not there yet. With some of our groups, still half of them we are not serving the way we have to serve or you know, 40% of them or 30% of them, we have more work to do. But when I first joined this board, I was told, yeah, you know what, it's, yeah, yeah, these kids aren't learning. Like there's something wrong with them. Like, I mean, there's only two possibilities, right? Either, either it's the kids or it's the system. And I do not believe it's the kids, so it's us. Um, and for years and years and years trying to figure out how we could make some traction and how we could make a difference and how we could better serve all students, and it felt like we were spinning our wheels and we were kind of throwing, we're trying this. So while I understand last year was rough and, and I didn't love the way it all happened, definitely what I am on board with was trying something new because what we had been doing wasn't working. And we, we really threw the kitchen sink at it, right? We tried a lot of different new things. So we can't say, oh, well, oh, gee, was the magic bullet or, or st adopting a new literacy curriculum was a new, I mean, we did so much, right? We made this a laser-focused goal and did a lot of different things. And um, it would be awesome if we could really identify this is the thing that made the difference um, because then we could tell other districts and they would know, oh, that's what they did because we don't have resources to do 15 things. We could do one thing. Um, and as much as I would love to be able to look at other districts and say, here's the silver bullet, um, what matters here is that I don't really care what, what it was. What I know is we threw the kitchen sink at it and something is making a difference and no longer are we looking at students as problems. <laughs> we are identifying the, the district practices or policies or biases or whatever as the problems and changing it. Um, so congratulations to every single human <laughs> that has worked with our students and all of our students for their hard work. Um, we definitely need some more goals. Um, and, and to me, this relates to the SWIFT plan in that we, in our goals, we have academic goals and we have these goals of belonging and these goals of being a valued part of our community. And um, given that we, we haven't solved this other problem yet, I think we're working on it, um, I am even impressed with the progress we've made. Because if you feel othered and you don't feel a valued part of the community, it's really hard to have access to your education and to do well. Um, but here we are making a huge difference already. So I'm thinking when we double down and we really, really solve the systemic biases that are in our district, um, among our staff, our students, our board, our administration, our community, everywhere, we've all got them, right? Um, when we really can, can double down on those, I can't imagine, I mean, I think, Demographics will no longer predict success. You will, you know, no that won't be a factor anymore. So thank you, thank you, thank you um, to everyone. And I look forward to, you know, next year and seeing what your new goals are. Uh, anything else on this particular item? Okay, I think we're going on to dual enrollment, correct? Now it's gonna hurt Dr. Che's feelings if we don't. If we don't clap for her after every word she says, yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, I was kind of joking. We don't have to do that, but <laughs> Dr. Che, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, thank you, Dr. Austin. Uh, we had a, a very robust ad hoc committee for dual enrollment uh, out of 
12 committees that we had, uh, dual enrollment was one of our focus in order to identify structure and support existing and as well as expansion of uh, offerings. There were nine committee members, uh, including counselors, um, teachers, administrators, and community members as well. Uh, we want to thank um, for their time and commitment uh, towards this dual enrollment committee. So for dual enrollment, we established MOU with Foothill in 2019 under AB 288 um, in order to support college and career access pathway. We're serving over 340 students under that uh, MOU. This includes child development, uh, sports medicine, stage tech, and a lot of CT courses. The purpose of CCAP, which is College and Career Pathway Partnership, is to expand dual enrollment, dual enrollment, especially for students who may not already be college bound and who are underrepresented in higher education. The goal of CCAP agree agreement is to develop seamless pathway from high school to community college for career technical education or transfer preparation to improve high school graduation rate or to help high school students achieve college and career readiness. One of the charge of the dual enrollment committee was to re-envision our mission and vision statement. Uh, they came up with uh, things like including creating seamless transition from high school to college, uh, providing opportunity to earn college credit, gain confidence in their academic abilities, as well as reducing costs for their post-secondary education, as well as as well as helping students succeed in college and beyond by providing them with the skills and knowledge they need to thrive in their academic and professional pursuits. For many of them, this is their first exposure to college credit course, and we're trying very hard to provide a safe, welcoming environment for them on our campus. Uh, also, I wanna thank all of our dual enrollment teachers that's, that are going extra miles to um, coordinate with Foothill and working with our counselors as well as district office. So we're working with Foothill um, to provide some stipend for them. That was part of their, um, the recommendation from the committee. Foothill is also willing to uh, provide instructional material for the funding um, of the materials such as textbooks and lab uh, materials because a lot of these courses are hands-on courses. The final recommendation from the dual enrollment committee is that they would like to leverage existing steering committee structure so that there is a process for if there needs to be a new course or there needs to be curricular alignment and also consider implication for post-secondary options as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have several community comments. Um, some familiar names here. Benjamin Vakil, uh, Albert Lee, and Ezra Furtado Tori. And then Devin Ardashan is fourth. Okay. Thank you again. Um, the idea of not allowing students to take academic courses that they were ready for, as Gunn and now Pally's admin have um, have done with uh, MVC, which, classify, which was classified as dual enrollment until really recently, is, antith is antithetical to the spirit of public education. To teach students that taking math classes is what causes them anxiety is more than counterproductive. Rather than telling students to follow their passion, in this case, we say, why are you interested in this? You must be pushed by your parents. Why don't you slow down, try something else? I hear robotics is fun. Uh, take a break. Um, some argue that the very act of having multivariable class available intrinsically is harmful to others so much that it cannot be offered. Um, we c public education is where all students should have the chance to follow their intellectual interests and passions, not telling them that there are, are things that should be available to families with abilities to do things outside of the public system, going to a private school, and taking courses at John Hopkins that cost thousands of dollars, doing some summer programs that cost $10,000. Um, we, we deliberately hobble these students, especially, especially those like me who are lucky enough to, that are lucky enough to be able to do outside, to do things outside. Um, it just hobbles these considerable number of students who want to continue learning. Now, we as, let's be honest, privileged, 
um, students don't want to be focused on. We just want to be allowed to follow our passions at PASD. All of this is why I'm skeptical about the intent of this um, report. However, I'm hopeful the board will continue working with students towards promoting a satisfactory conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Albert Lee, then Ezra, then Devin. Uh, hi, all. It is clear that the current methods of communication surrounding MVC are inadequate. Therefore, a regularly held committee where students and staff can voice concerns, questions, and needs would help, would help correct the confusion that permeates discussion. While everyone at the district has been doing their best to maintain clear avenues for information, the current structure is simply unable to meet current necessities. I'd like to thank Ms. DeBranza for meeting with us and to quickly mention that we'd love to meet with other community members for further discussion. During that meeting, Ms. DeBranza mentioned difficulty in addressing questions separately, especially on a when asked basis because a response that answers one question may, or one need may not answer other questions or needs that have appeared in the meantime. A committee for students and staff would create highly accessible communication that can address questions about math education and are highly necessary to address the needs and voices of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Ezra and then Devin. Uh, hi again. Um, first of all, we're very appreciative of the efforts that Dr. Show made to make sure that every student can register for both the Pali MVC course and other Foothill courses. Dr. Show said that Foothill promised to accommodate every high school student who registers for their courses, which I wasn't aware about earlier. So thanks for clarifying that point and making sure that we can take the classes. However, unfortunately, I haven't seen this in practice as I wasn't able to take a differential equations class that I signed up for this summer, despite reaching out to the Foothill um, PAUSD dual enrollment coordinator, the Foothill STEM Dean, the professor teaching the class, and Dr. Show, as well as filling out the forms for the course one month in advance and satisfying all the prerequisites. Furthermore, uh, the Foothill coordinator for PAUSD said that high school students will continue to get last priority to sign up for classes at Foothill, which essentially renders asynchronous options for the MVC class um, not accessible. So it's great that the district claims an effort is being made to increase accessibility, but at this point, we see little evidence of such an effort. Thank you. Thank you. Devin? Hello. Oh, I'm excited I get two minutes. Uh, so I guess I'll just preface this by saying, you know, dual enrollment is wonderful. I think we've seen the benefits in our district with the expansion of dual enrollment offerings. Uh, we've seen the numbers from the introduction of CCAP legislation and the adoption of CCAP partnerships, you know, across the state of California and increasing community college enrollment rates, increasing UC and CSU transfer rates. So like the work that's being done there is wonderful and I'm super happy the district's doing that. That said, I do have a couple concerns about how dual enrollment's being considered in PAUSD. Um, the first, which I've mentioned before, is that PAUSD's narrow definition of dual enrollment doesn't really match ed code, um, specifically section 76004. Um, dual enrollment is simply whenever high school uh, students take college credit classes um, and they're so-called special part-time students and there are many different ways to implement this. Uh, you have CCAP courses, non-CCAP, you can have different teaching models, uh, high school teacher, college teacher, co-teaching. Um, so it's a very broad definition. Uh, I'm also concerned that PAUSD is using the term articulation, uh, particularly because articulated high school courses are not dual enrollment. Uh, they fall under a separate set of regulations and actually students must participate in a credit by examination process for articulated courses. And these courses don't go through the same oversight um, with the college that uh, dual enrollment courses do. Uh, also, PAUSD appears to be including dual enrollment courses in the UC A to G list, and that doesn't actually follow UC guidelines. Uh, dual enrollment courses are to be reported as a college course and not actually be on the high school list. So I think we probably should look at that. Um, lastly, I want to reiterate that there is not actually really any credentialing issue for counting these classes, uh, college classes towards GPA. Uh, the relevant laws have not changed in many years. And so I don't think the CDE appreciates being thrown under the bus for what is basically a local decision. Um, that's all I have, thanks. Thank you. Colleagues, shall we go back this way again? Ms. Siegel. Um, I wanted to thank the committee. I want to express a heartfelt thank you to each and every student who has spoken at the past board meetings. When I was a student here, I definitely did not have the courage to speak at the board meeting, and so I want to say that I heard you and it was very much appreciated. I also want to thank parents and staff who have spoken. 
and thank all of our dual enrollment teachers. I'm definitely in support of the stipend for teachers who teach dual enrollment courses as it is a very difficult course to teach and involves a lot of extra work and communication. Um, the statements made by the principals, counselors, and math instructional leads at the last board meeting also provided me with a much needed and much appreciated viewpoint and has helped to shape and formulate my thoughts. The math teachers who have been teaching in this district for decades who spoke um, have valuable experience and insight and I also want to personally thank Jung for taking time to speak with me on the phone about this complicated issue. I researched it last year at the CSBA conference and attended a session on it, but it's a very <laughs> complex issue, so I wanna thank you for personally taking time to speak with me. Um, this whole experience has led to me wondering if this is like a process versus a product issue. Um, I've spoken to or at least offered a phone call to each and every community member who's reached out to me with concerns on this topic. And I am confident that the breakdown in communication would not have happened and families would be more understanding had we discussed and partnered with our community to find solutions. I feel like what was really hard is we had lots of people talking and lots of people speaking, but I think if there had been an in-person meeting where stakeholders and staff and especially students could be heard and feel like they were partnered, I think that would have been helpful. Um, so I would like to see PAUSD offer an in-person meeting with parents, students, stakeholders, staff, um, just to help clarify the offerings and rationales and brainstorm possible solutions. I have found that when it's done, even if it's just once on the phone, or once in person with people present, it can really do, go a long way to build trust um, versus you know, getting you know, emails back and forth or um, open forum. Um, and with all of that said, I think collaboration and partnership are essential to build trust in community. I hope this is an area of focus for next year. The demand for this course has only grown over the last decade and will likely continue to grow. So I encourage that we get creative and collaborate on possible solutions that are supported by our teachers, that are supported by our staff, um, but also doesn't tax students' mental health by having to sacrifice after school jobs, sports, and clubs. So I just want there to be a fruitful discussion where everybody's at the table so we can try to come up with solutions that work well for everyone and where communication can be as clear as possible. That's all. Mr. Dart. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I have a slightly different perspective, um, which is that, you know, I appreciate the ad hoc committees, all of them, and, and specifically this one, because, you know, this isn't something that we had previously in, in the same robust form as we have now. And when we started these, these ad hoc committees, and as we've seen the results, it struck me as a great move in the direction of the type of focused stakeholder perspective that we've been seeking for a few years and, and saying we need community input, but it's very difficult to figure out how to get that community input because um, as someone said, as a colleague of mine said, you know, folks will speak at board meetings. I mean, it takes a certain level of motivation, courage. It's a self-selecting group. And kudos to everybody who speaks at board meetings because it's not easy to stand up in front of all these people and talk about an issue that, that you know, you're passionate about. It is not a representative way to, to seek feedback from the community of 15,000 know, um, stakeholders. So the question is, how do we do that? And, and I think the ad hoc committees are, are the step that the district has taken. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm gratified to see the results of the ad hoc. Can it be better? Of course, everything can be better. And I appreciate Dr. DeBrianza meeting with our, our students in the community to, to sort of form that relationship between the board or board members and, and students um, that I see as separate from the ad hoc committees, which are working committees composed of, of experts and voices from the community that can deliver us real concrete um, updates on, on you know, programmatic solutions. So uh, I, I hear what, what my colleague is saying, what Ms. Siegel is saying about asking for feedback. I know that being on the board for five years, we've struggled with the question of what that means. And I, my colleagues have been here even longer 
um, asking that question. So to me, the, the ad hoc committees are, are an answer to that and one that I'm, I'm happy about and one that I'm glad that we're going to continue to see. And thank you for all your work. And thank you for your, your engagement with the community because I know um, a lot of folks had questions and, and I heard from many community members that you were very responsive and, and very um, respectful. So appreciate it. So to the point about the ad hoc committee, we, you presented um, out, we do, my understanding of this is CCAP, that's, what, that's our dual enrollment plan, we, which is the mission of that, as you outlined here, is expanding dual enrollment for students who may not already be college bound or who are underrepresented in higher education. There is an option for non-CCAP, which the definition of that is advanced scholastic and vocational training. So it, although the recommendations did not specifically say we are recommending only CCAP and not non-CCAP dual enrollment options, are we to assume that because there was not a non-CCAP option presented that, that it, you are in effect only recommending that we stick with one track only? We could do both, right? We could have non-CCAP, but that would be a, sort of another set of regulations, contracts, logistics. Is that that correct? is correct. Currently, we don't have non-CCAP agreement with Foothill. The reason why we started with CCAP and the reason there was a push from the legislation to push for CCAP is because for non-CCAP, there have been a lot of opportunities that students have been taking um, advantage of, such as APs and other courses. So they were already taking those courses. Uh, the CCAP really gained a lot of momentum um, nationally just to provide that first college experience for students who normally is scared to take AP and th there's another way of being exposed to college. So that's why. So to, to I think piggyback on my colleague, Mr. Rapp's point, this, we had an ad hoc committee it, these are the recommendations it came back with. They could have come back with a recommendation that we proceed with CCAP and we proceed with no, a non-CCAP option. That is not being presented to us. Well, at least that, those aren't the present, that isn't the recommendation of the committee. No. Staff may still come back to us with that recommendation, but currently right now that's not what the committee, that was stakeholders that got together that met multiple times that had community input. Correct. That and is not what that, that, or that entity that was designed in order to get community and stakeholder feedback on dual enrollment did not come back with a recommendation for non-CCAP. No, they, they really focused on how they can improve the current CCAP, okay. um, given the counselor group, teacher group, so they felt like that was a need. Okay. So staff still could come back to us, but that's not what the ad hoc committee did, recommendations are. Correct. Can I, are you done? Yeah. Oh, I'd want can, to I, clarify that. can I ask a question? Um, so, just to clarify, so non-CCAP has been around for a long time, and you know CCAP is a relatively new program, new legislation, and non-CCAP has been available for enrichment programs for. So I wouldn't say it's non-CCAP, but there was not many guidelines, so everything was kind of loosey and um, thrown under dual enrollment. But with the le new legislation that came with AB 288, yeah. they came out with this thing that in order to establish dual enrollment, you need to establish a, a formal contract with the community college. Before, yeah. that wasn't the case. Okay. So that so, contract was between either non-CCAP or CCAP. So yeah, I just want to clarify, because I mean, we're focusing on CCAP because CCAP's a big new thing, gets a lot more kids. It, it addresses the need for underrepresented kids to get the on-ramp into community college, and ultimately four-year degrees if they choose, and it, you know, it, it requires a fairly heavy lift on the part of both the high school district and the community college district to, you know, make things, make create these pathways that work. It doesn't preclude no. doing non-CCAP activities, enrichment activities like we've done in the past and mm -hmm. I assume we're gonna to continue to do in the future. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't the priority of what this committee saw we needed to work on. Correct. Right, because there are other activity, other yeah. options like APs, like you said, and you know, the, the, we, nothing would preclude us from offering other course, courses in conjunction with Foothill or some other community college if we chose. Right. 
Correct. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. Thank you. And you can come back. You could come back to us with those recommendations at some point if you want to. Right? I mean, we're not going to direct that, I guess. Or just but do or just do well. Do we do we don't do any right now though, right? We don't have any non CCAP courses now. If we don't have that MOU with Foothill. We never established one. Okay. Focus has been on CCAP. Okay. Um, but but just I might can I just clarify? Yeah. But you can just do one if you want. You don't need board authorization to go do that. We'd oh, 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 we will need a board approval. Yes. Uh, yeah, but once yeah. you've once you've Correct. done it and got it served up. Correct. Just like we approve every other contract, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, first, thank you. Thank you to all the committee members who did this work um, and for expanding this, right? I mean, I think um, just in the past couple of weeks at, at the showcases and at graduation, I met so many students that are in different pathways that really got a lot out of their experience and were really excited about the college classes they had taken and their little um, <laughs> little cord. extra mm -hmm. cord at graduation. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I get it's sort of the same question that's been asked some, but I guess I'm wondering if, is there anything that precludes us, right? If we suddenly had a teacher that was interested in teaching, say, multivariable calculus, I think that would be a conversation in a lot of ways because we've had counselors express some concern. We've, you know, there's there, there are a lot of different things but that we'd have to work out. But it's not impossible to add it if the district so desired, right? It's not a CCAP pathway, but it's possible to have other classes, whether it be multivariable calculus or something else, in different pathways. Yeah. Uh, right, that are not pathways, just that we could offer. Yes, we can. But we'd have to enter into a new agreement with Foothill. Foothill, a yes. A non-CCAP. Correct. Agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, and, you know, one thing I'd be really interested in, Dr. Lopez, I think, would be if we could just get an update at some point as to how many different classes our, our Pally and our gun students take outside. You know, I, we've had students come up and talk about following their passions and they're really passionate about a topic and about a subject area and they want to take a class in it. And I think that there are a lot of our high school students that take classes that they're passionate about outside of our school because we just don't offer that class. But I think it would be really interesting to know like how many a year do that and are they core academic classes, are they languages, are they extracurriculars? How, like how many of those classes just do our students take outside of school because they're interested in it or for whatever reason? I think that we know that because they come back and tell us on the transcript, right? Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Because the, the answers can be very different depending on which way you want us to look at this. Okay. If you're talking about community college courses, that will give us one answer. If you want to know any third party that will give us a different answer. I'm interested Which in third part, just because I'm interested in this idea of like who pursues, right, in their own time, that when you have a sport or an activity or a job or other academics, what you pursue and why, and how many of our students, we don't offer it here at Pally or Gun, so they go outside, and maybe it's before school or after school or on weekends or asynchronous or evenings or whatever, they're pursuing some interest of theirs. So I missed the very most important yeah. part of your Anything. answer. Any third party. Anything. Thank Any third you. party. Okay, we can do that. I mean, that's my curiosity. Yeah, I Maybe wanna, you want both. Anyway. That was exactly sort of the questions I was getting at because the one thing that I think of is all of the students we know who go to Pali who want to take German. I mean, this is always coming up. I know like five students personally who literally thought about going to gun. And so um, sort of that, yeah. I, and I don't think they're taking it at community college. I think they're fine. They're doing language bird or something else. Yeah, they're finding some other way to do it. But it, it feels like if, if we need to have a more robust conversation about all the different programs. I mean, I think multivariable calculus is specific because we used to offer it and now we don't. So we, know, we already, we sort of know the students that are interested in because we have a history of offering it and students signed up. I assume if we offer German, we would have a big robust group of students who would immediately want to sign up for it. So. So I just want to make sure we're not missing. Yeah, I'm just curious it's to know, a larger what, conversation. You know what classes, how many are taken outside? What are they taking outside? Um, we might not be able to know when they're taking them. But I do think that a lot of students pursue an interest outside of school because we happen not to offer things. You know, obviously, we can't offer everything. And sadly, with declining enrollment, we probably have fewer offer offerings we're going to be able to make depend, you know, if there's not enough enrollment to... Um, to run a class, so, right? So now I have one more clarifier. Uh -oh. The distinction between they're taking it because we don't offer it versus 
they're taking a third party. A third party could be literally over a thousand. Okay, just based on what I've seen on spreadsheets. If we want third party, again, that's one answer. If we want anything third party, that's an answer. If we want only community colleges, that's an answer. But if we want to know only classes that are taken that we don't offer, that's a different answer. Because you're saying there's some critical mass of students who we offer a class, but they decide to take it outside. I would say that's going to be the overwhelming majority, actually. But that's that's a little bit, just through looking at the spreadsheets, that's not that I have the data at my fingertips. All right, so, so I don't. I, this is not intended to be like a huge overwhelming task, but sometime, I, I don't need it next week, <laughs> right? But I think it would be really useful for us to have a sense of, because if there is some class we're offering and the majority of students, you know, we offer one section of it at school and there's 50 kids taking it outside, yeah. why are most going outside? <laughs> I mean, that's just another question. We can do that. I just okay. want to make sure we're responsive and we know that the most precise question we can get, the better our response will be for you. And just especially because we have to enter into a separate MOU, and I was looking at that chart, and there's like, it's not just an MOU. There's a lot of requirements on the teachers. That's I mean, it's a big thing. So it's a big MOU. Ms. DeBrienz's question was, assuming we had a teacher, well, that's like a big assumption, right? So if assuming we don't have a teacher, because I think most of these classes we don't have a teacher, which is why we don't offer them. Um, what are we looking at? Like, what log kind of logistics are we looking at? That um, and 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 if we're going to do that, are there four different classes that we know students would be interested in, which might make it more worthwhile for us to sort of go down that path? Yeah, the legislation really distinguishes what we can do over non-CCAP versus CCAP. One of the major thing is with non-CCAP. Um, we cannot close the section to just our students. We have to welcome Foothill students on our campus. So that's part of the legislation. It's, it is really geared towards to help students first experience of college exposure. Um, that's why there are some advantages for not uh, CCAP students. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry. Um, some quick follow-ups, just kind of going back to my um, having a meeting. I noted that the committee, what kind of made me think of this is the committee only had one student. And I just think that student voice is so important. And so if our ad hoc committee only has one student, I do feel like that's not enough student voice for a student course. Um, for me, I think the, the question would be how many community college courses. I think that's very different than third party vendor. I think that's a whole different topic because this specific class is the next step in their math. So this is, I think it's very different than an outside vendor. This is, we, if, if they accelerate by skipping one grade, then their senior year, this is actually their next class in that sequence. And so I just think it's important that we're differentiating, differentiating between outside third party vendors and community college courses that students are taking because they are not offered on our campus. So I think that's what I would focus on. I would imagine that we would break it down, right? We'd see both of those. I mean, there's there are many classes in our district that are that terminate when kids could take another year of it, but we don't offer it. There's, you know, it's not just it's not just math. There's lots of different subjects and lots of different um, for all the languages for sure. Kids finish them before they're senior and they want to do the next thing. Um, but I think there's a lot of those. So I, I would imagine that if you come back to us, you will sort them by these are community college classes. These are you know, language two, classes. Two things. I just oh, consulted oh, quickly with okay. Dr. Lopez. Yeah. We think we've got enough of the information to get it back. It may not be exactly precise. It'll be good enough for this exercise. Yeah. But when it goes back to engaging with students, I, I think it is a trap to make that a district committee. I think that is much, much better served running through the high schools, allowing them to do it where they have the students on campus during a school day with counselors and teachers. So that would be my strong recommendation. You're saying communication between students and ILs, counselors, teachers, principal, yeah. about course offerings and whatnot. Yes, because while we're always going to have a smaller number because of a million reasons, including our committees are after school hours, right? We're not pulling kids out of school to come over here. Uh, the school sites, not only is it more appropriate, I think it's something we need to get back to, putting those on the school sites. And that can get us a broader representation. Great. Also better product and more appropriate at the same time. Great, okay, is that all? Okay, I think this might be a record for the latest we've ever done the consent calendar. 
Um, but I believe the consent calendar is next. And I am going to start by, before someone makes a motion, we have, um, we have, I believe, some, we have two comments for the SEL item, which is, am I need help finding it right now? Uh, scope of work, authorization, what is it, O? Yes, O. Okay, so can I get a motion that considers that 5-0 is going to have a community comment? I move that we, um, we approve the consent calendar with the exception of O. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay, so the consent calendar is in, in approved except for O, which means O is going to be our next item. It is sort of now classified as, as 6A1. Um, o. There is no presentation on it because it was on consent. So I'm going to call on our two commenters. Um, we all have two minutes each. We have Lakeisha Phillips Marshall and then um, Eamon Reynolds. Um, good evening, board. My name is Lakeisha Phillips Marshall, and I have two children in the first and fourth grade at Escondido. Uh, what I'd like to speak on tonight is the social emotional learning SEL of all students in PAUSD. Our children are being harmed by the lack of accountability of the trusted adults they spend time with daily. For my family, this looks like my eight-year-old wanting to kill himself because no one would protect him from a school bully two years in a row. But SEL is bigger than just my children and the students of PAUSD. Given the recent events that took place at Escondido with the use of the N-word, the lack of mental health services and communication to both the students and families is unacceptable. We need accountability. The work is hard and we all make mistakes. The important question is how do we recover from those mistakes? We need to start with empathy. When we exercise empathy, we are all able to understand how our actions land on the other person. For changes to happen, it must involve all of us. Allyship is critical to lasting, meaningful change. It starts with building relationships. I think the second step elementary curriculum being adopted as the SEL supplemental curriculum is the first step and should be incorporated into the PAUSD promise. All families de deserve this, and we are counting on you to step up and implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eamon Reynolds. Hello, um, I'm Iman Reynolds. I have four students in the district, and um, how will the second step transformative SEL curriculum help my kids? Um, how is accountability measured, and will it be included in the SWIFT policy? Um, in the incident of hate speech at Escondido, uh, which my student was uh, impacted by thoroughly, there was a blatant lack of cultural sensitivity and appropriate policy that does not further traumatize all the students involved. Um, there was no opportunity or process to process the gravity of the hate speech, the negligence of the principal to provide appropriate supports, processing, feeling, and healing. Um, and there was, where were the restorative tools, not just disciplinary tools, for the community that was impacted <clears throat> by his classmates who were also impacted as witnesses to their friends being hurt? How will this curriculum help? Social emotional learning is important to have the vocabulary, to speak the words, to deal with the feelings, to create better outcomes and behaviors, and understanding the generational pains that are carried with hate speech and the deep wounds that are inflicted when they're said. Can our kids do that on our own? We can't. Um, add your memories from the times throughout your years in school, even back to elementary. As an African-American uh, family, we recall very vividly the first time the N-word was wielded. Imagine in your space, if you were empowered with the support and social emotional tools to navigate the things that occurred in your life at school. We can empower our kids to do that now. Does this curriculum do that work? Um, the elementary kids we have become the middle school kids, that become the high school kids, that move on into this world as adults, that fill the seats you will empty one day and become the change makers for the next generation of this greater community? Will this curriculum show the students of PAUSD what it means to stand in very hard conversations, tackle the truth of how broken systems impact the community? When we neglect to learn and provide the tools and the vocabulary for navigating our social, emotional, and lived experiences, 
We are not equipped to handle the crucial conversations and change necessary to support the vision we seek in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, this is up for action. Why don't we get a, get a motion on the table and then anyone can make any comments if they want to. Uh, I move approval of item L. I'll second. Okay, so we have on the table to approve it. Uh, does anybody have any comments? Great. Yes. On. Children who don't feel safe physically and emotionally are going to struggle to succeed academically, period. Um, thank you to the parents who just spoke. SEL is not just about race, and at the same time, it is very much about race. Um, I'm not gonna repeat everything I said before. I'll just say that the experiences of these children, their parents just related to us, are telling us something about our educational ecosystem. And we know in our schools right now that kids are harassed and excluded and bullied and worse on the basis of race, gender identity, neurodiversity, income level, and even nothing at all. And you know, I do want to say our kids are growing up in this community and they listen to adults compare cars and fancy ski vacations. And some speak publicly even at these board meetings, cutting each other down for lack of a college degree or a fancy enough pedigree. They grow up internalizing the societal pecking order that they're growing up in. And so we shouldn't be surprised by the way this plays out, both externally in the way they view and treat their peers and internally in the way they view and treat themselves. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised, but we, we really also can't use it as an excuse for not fulfilling our duty to create schools where students feel safe and can thrive academically and emotionally. And I want to say, in his end of the year update, I wrote this down so I'd get it right, Dr. Austin wrote that we must consider the potential consequences of building competitive excellence on an unstable foundation. Inclusion, civility, mental health, and positive relationships are still the cornerstone of a happy life. Our community can only be as good as the worst day in the life of a student. If they are disparaged, then we are disparaged. If they are sad, then we are sad. If they are friendless, then we are friendless. So I really hope and expect that we're going to approve this curriculum. It's certainly only the first step, but it is a crucial step, I think, to stabilizing our foundation and, and healing us. Okay, Ms. Siegel. Sorry, really, really quickly, one of my questions was, we are a K or a TK through, or a PK through 12 district and SEL and good SEL matters. And so a question I have is, we have this language being used in elementary school that hopefully children will um, absorb and take with them to middle school, but are, why are we not, do we have an SEL curriculum in place for middle school? Because at least my experience in middle school and from what I've heard from many different families is that can be a time of increased bullying. Um, so that was my question about middle school. Thank you. I, I, I'd love to answer that. Um, actually, our middle schools are uh, implementing second step at this time. They will continue to explore second step into next year. The problem we currently found with it, it is that it didn't go deep enough, and some of the kids found it a little bit cheesy. So um, part of our work with the committee is to really look at how we can make that more engaging and go deeper for our students in middle school. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, our board's focus and my focus in particular for, for a long time has been mental health and it's been equity. And SEL is really the intersection between the two. I mean, it's, this is, um, you know, it's the linchpin. And I mean, I'm very supportive of this and, and I think we're all probably going to approve to uh, vote to approve it. But all I really wanted to say was it was very, um, it was very impressive to see our speakers who have had to go through um, what too many in our district have had to go through, speak with 
just a great amount of grace and empathy and optimism in terms of encouraging us to, to move forward. Um, and, and to me, the, the SL curriculum, I mean, at its core, is going to allow us to graduate students who are going to leave our district being able to model that same kind of grace to others and to themselves. Um, or as my three-year-old says, to be kindful and mindful. And so, um, yes, I do hope that this, this is the curriculum. And if it's not, then we as the board are going to make sure that we're exercising oversight and making sure that, you know, the next best thing is, is put in place. So that's all. Let's, let's vote. Well, after um, we speak. Yeah. Okay. So I guess, <laughs> go, Mr. Collins, anything? Okay. Um, I want to thank the speakers for coming to, to speak up today. I'm sure that it wasn't easy. Um, and for many, it feels, I think, an intractable issue, right? If you have been hearing for decades, if you have been experiencing something like this for decades and asking for change for decades, it's probably pretty hard to imagine that we're really serious about making change now. Um, hopefully seeing some ESRI improvements might, might convince people that, no, no, we're really, we're really on board here. Um, but I, I think that an SEL curriculum alone obviously can't solve our issues of bias and inequity and, you know, all, all, of, these, all of these issues. Um, obviously, a good SEL curriculum is a good first step, and it sounds like we're being told by staff that this is a good first step. Um, I do hope that the... <laughs> Um, I do hope that the middle school either settles on a way to kind of make some improvements to this one or finds another one. But I know for a couple of years, we talked about having some continuity all the way through so that kids have the same language and the same practices and whatnot. Um, because as we know, middle school gets even tougher. Um, we're, we're really committed to closing the achievement gap. We just saw a great report that showed some good progress on that. Um, but also, we, we've said from the beginning, it's not just about the test scores, right? It's it's also about this the sense of inclusion, um, and where where everyone has access to their education and everyone has the supports they need and everyone is treated like they belong. Um, for parents who have seen this happen over and over again, you know, and not see any change, I, I imagine that we don't have a lot of trust. And all we can do is actually do the work, right? It's um, I don't think that it is worth. Um, I was, I was putting energy into saying, hey, we're really serious. Let's, you know, let's just do the work. <laughs> let's do the work and the community will see that we're doing it. Um, I think the problem is here that as hard as ESRI was, this work is harder. This is the bias. This is the, um, this is the systems work that people don't want to look at. This is the systems work that um, is really hard to do and really uncomfortable. Um, it's the work that helps the board and the administration and the principals and the parents and the students see that we all have biases and that some of those biases are really harmful to some of our students, especially when they aren't the, the, the a, a critical mass of them in our district and they feel other just by that nature alone. Um, so this isn't easy and it's not going to be easy. And there are, some, there are some in this district that are working so hard on this just two weeks ago. Well, last week we had a big celebration of our equity leadership, literacy, equity leaders, literacy leadership coalition cohort. Um, and the and to see yeah thank you for the thank you for the I, every word <laughs> equity I got equity, got equity. Um, to see the work that is happening at so many of our sites and how many of our staff um, are so committed to this work and um, I especially liked Miss Conaway that you gave some awards to some people that didn't miss a single meeting all year and I cannot imagine being a principal a teacher an aide and ha working a whole long day a, in a really hard job and then never once missing the ELLC meeting. Um, there are people that are doing this work that wanna do this work, that wanna make a difference for kids that we have continued to fail. Um, and then there's people that don't wanna do the work, either because it's really hard and uncomfortable or because they don't acknowledge that it's work that needs to be done. Um, but I think that, that this board is saying that is a part of the SWIFT plan and that is a part of the work that has to be done. And again, we need to like put our foot on the gas and double down on this work. Um, and if it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable. And um, I, for one, am happy to say, wow, I really screwed that up and wow, here are my biases. Um, it's hard to do, but I think that when we model it, when we model it, um, is when it, it starts to become more comfortable. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we're not the only influencers of students in our district, right? Our students 
um, are on social media, our students watch TV and movies, our students um, are online, our students have parents' biases because we all have them, um, and they bring all that to school too. So um, it's not like we can solve this issue alone. Um, and I, I am really curious, um, I, I don't know that there needs to be a big budget line item to this, maybe you're gonna come tell us that there does need to be, um, but I am really curious to know in, in the coming meetings, I guess we're looking at the fall, what sorts of things are planned, not just for our students, but for our staff, for our community, for the board, um, what kinds of things we're doing to, to really just move the needle on this, because this is the single hardest thing I think we will ever do. Um, so. I, I am all in for approving, for adopting this curriculum, um, and there is so much more besides the SEL formal curriculum that, that we need to do, and I hope that we continue to see it come out in the SWIFT plan. Um, are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of adopting the SEL curriculum? Aye. 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 Great, wonderful, thank you. We can take a break. Can we make it like a three minute break? Oh, maybe staff needs it. Okay. All right, five minute break, we'll come back at 8.58.
excuse me, having a little snack. Uh, 7A, Dr. Austin. Uh, Mr. Bahadur Singh has 20 seconds to frame up this item. 6A. Yes, uh, I went right. real quick. This came back. This came to before the board at the last meeting. This is it requires the two uh, two meeting rules. So this is the declaration of need. The only changes is there is an amendment to this item to include uh, permits for um, art and English. Uh, I move acceptance of the item as presented. I second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yay. Six B. Mr. Holm. Aye. Now that you saw how we're going to run the second half of this meeting. <laughs> uh, a lot of pressure. Okay. Um, so our item is approval of a resolution and award a contract for paving improvements at Nixon Elementary School. Uh, this one's a little bit quirky. This is a pretty standard maintenance project. We're just repaving. Uh, we bid it as the, what's the informal bidding act, um, which is less formal than a traditional bid. Usually it works for these small paving projects and such. And, but it has a cap on $200,000. Uh, we thought the project was going to be about 130, but paving prices have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. And there is an allowance in the Informal Bidding Act that uh, if it goes over 200, but not um, over 212, 500, I think the limit is, uh, the board by resolution can accept the bid. So we just squeaked under the 212 limit, um, but it does require a board resolution to accept the bid of 209, 200. Okay. Can I ask a question before we? You may, well, let's get a motion on the table. I move that we approve the resolution. Second. Great. Now it's on the table. Go ahead. Um, can we clarify that this is this is a first reading of this item, correct? This so this the first reading we actually took the um, permission to bid to you guys previously. Mm -hmm. So normally this would have just been accepting the award, and and as a maintenance project, it would have been consult consent. Uh, it's just weird because we. We just crossed this threshold, so it now requires a board resolution. Okay. Sure. Uh, I, and I think in addition, um, since the two-meeting rule has an exception for routine contract approvals, right? Yeah. I think it would qualify under that exception. So I just wanted to clarify for anyone who might be uh, watching that that, in, that, we, that this, in fact, does not require uh, a, the two-meeting rule. That was my question. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are at 7A. Oh, this is when I get to do my public hearing. Yeah. That's part of the job. <laughs> so, so excited. Uh, yep. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Do I start? You do. Okay. For our annual LCAP public hearing, I am opening the hearing. I believe. There are comments. Should I take them before I close the public hearing, or should I take them while it's open? We've never had one during. So I'm going to take them, and then I'll close the meeting. That's fine. They'll, yeah, they just get one shot at it. It's fine. Well, right. But usually we open it, close it, and then we discuss it, and I don't know why. So, right. Okay, so uh, Edith Cohen and Stephen Davis. Edith Cohen might be on Zoom. Okay, hi. Hello. Hello. Yep. Okay, so I looked at the LCAP uh, report. It's a long report. It seems designed to satisfy a legal reporting requ requirements. It's uh, less designed to be helpful. Uh, some metrics or indicators are very poorly constructed. Information is, is uh, presented in selective ways. Um, so, uh, Okay, so one, one issue is that the report mentions the use of a, a real map in the elementary school and MDTP assessments at the middle school, but these results are never reported to the public. Um, and they, instead, they, they use the SBAC results, a difference between last year and this year, but last year the, the participation was very low, so it's completely meaningless. Uh, so I will tell you what I see in the MDTP data. So first, let's start with the students that entered high school. Uh, so let's uh, look at the students that uh, placed in algebra in ninth grade this uh, year. And according to the MDTP, 90% of these students uh, scored less than 75% on the MDTP. They are completely not ready to algebra. And they, I don't know what support they are getting, but they are placed in a course they are not ready for. 
As for the student that plays in geometry, uh, ninth graders this year, 50% are not ready for geometry. 30% are very ready, 20% are in the middle. And uh, in that course, 120 students land down. I don't know even if they were informed how unready they were. Uh, for middle school algebra, 20, 23% are utterly unready for the course. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, we have been through that. It's, uh, it's, it's not okay to place the accelerator. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Mr. Davis? Good evening. Um, a couple real quick comments. Uh, one, um, I'm not sure when this was updated. Uh, the uh, unfortunate collapse of uh, students with disabilities, chronic absenteeism that has been reported onto the board didn't make it into the LCAP. So I don't know if that's a document synchronization problem. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, which is a general problem, which is the use of California's terrible blue, red, yellow thing, as if it meant anything except for whether Tony Thurman, I guess, is going to give you a bad day sometime. Um, everybody should be doing better than that, right? Um, those aren't the numbers you want. They're basically getting called to the state principal's office as opposed to doing well. They're not the standards we should be using. And they seem to pro show up, unfortunately, rather uh, more often for our disadvantaged communities in the school district. It's kind of actually a red flag that um, we're not doing very well for a group when we start quoting blue, green, red silliness. So please stop. Use the data. The California data is really helpful. Um, uh, I use the California data by hand to identify our disproportionality problems. Uh, you can too. Let's use data well so we can do better. Um, I mean, a big part of our reading improvement was to look at the data and start looking at the data at the next level down and then the next level down to figure out what it takes to do better. That's what we need to do for everything. Um, please use, the LCAP's an important document. It shouldn't be a kill the tree, put on the shelf kind of uh, exercise. So let's do better with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with no more comments, I'm going to close the hearing. Doesn't mean the item's done, but I'm gonna close the hearing. And now, if anyone has any comments about the LCAP. Oh, there is a presentation. <laughs> Great. No, let's do that. Let's do that. No, the, well, the hearing was open. We should take the comments. Okay, now we can have the presentation. All right, well, <clears throat> thank you for the feedback, uh, you know, regarding the LCAP. So this evening, we're going to be, uh, we are. So I will be conducting the public, public hearing, and this is just part of the finalization and completion of the annual LCAP that we, uh, we have to conduct every year. So in this slide, uh, you know, these are the different components that are uh, that we have to complete in order to to finish the LCAP. It's pretty it's pretty uh, intensive. There's a lot of us that are involved uh, during this process. Uh, there was a lot of collaboration that took place from all the different departments. Uh, we conducted a, a ongoing feedback and and uh, or we were given ongoing feedback from our educational partners. But also we utilize the DAC and the DLAC meetings as well to, to get some you know, feedback from our, our communities just to make sure that we were uh, you know, acknowledging all the, uh, the information they were providing us, but also helping us calibrate during this process. Uh, here's an example in this. So this is the timeline that we use. And, and again, uh, we started from end of October, you know, conducting our, our meetings uh, during DLAC, providing uh, the overview of the, of the LCAP, just, you know, uh, giving information as to what we, what we were doing just to help us again calibrate. Um, we conducted uh, uh, classroom presentations. Uh, we did a, a, a LCAP uh, board report in, on February 14th, provided this information again, again with our uh, administration and management, uh, did a PAEA, uh, uh, meeting just so we can get again our, our feedback uh, and get feedback from our teachers as well uh, And we also we recently conducted a SOFA consultation just to make sure that uh, You know regarding our students with special needs. We were meeting the, the specific uh, criteria and, and we were on track to make sure that we were meeting their needs uh, 
uh, as well. Uh, so here are our, our three goals. So first goal is high quality education uh, and teaching, uh, high quality teaching and learning, I should say, I'm sorry. Uh, equity and excellence and wellness uh, and safety. So here are some of the highlights of our um, goal number one. Uh, so ongoing support, uh, ongoing site support on best teaching practices for EL students. Uh, the Every Student Re Read Initiative, as uh, presented earlier by uh, Ms. Reynolds, all students, uh, all student groups exceeded the 3% goal. Uh, along to follow up on that, um, I know this is our first year, but we have been focusing on secondary. So the secondary uh, reading initiative uh, has been um, in place, and we look forward to continue to, to lead up the work that has been conducted at the elementary, but also to continue that, obviously, with the high school. Usually it's the other way around, but it's been, you know, we've... Uh, the elementary has been doing such a great job with this work. Also, uh, reading, our reading and EO specialists uh, collaborated and provided ongoing training for our teachers to support the needs of English learners and students with disabilities. Um, the elementary creativity card provided uh, up to, or more than 13,000 kids for, uh, for students. Uh, goal number one, and here are some of the action items for next year. So as mentioned earlier by um, Ms. Reynolds, again, the, the fourth and fifth grade teachers will be trained on the OG uh, morphology methodology. Uh, the elementary schools will continue to focus on implementing the science adopted curriculum for TK and fifth grade. Uh, secondary principals and leadership uh, teams will focus on evidence-based gradings to build a common understanding as it will be part of our continued work for future years. For goal number two, uh, here are some of the highlights. You know, as mentioned uh, earlier in uh, other board meetings, both high schools reached a 95% of participation rate on the CASP, which is, uh, hasn't been done, I don't think, ever here in our district. Uh, teachers participated in training utilizing the EL toolkit uh, implement, and implemented these strategies on their team teaching in small groups. Um, also, the EL students maintain their performance level in math in the 2021 CASP um, assessment that was conducted. Some of the action items for goal number two will be, uh, you know, the implementation of our MTS test platform. It's going to be utilized in all of our school sites. Uh, the implementation and, and continue to implement, I would say, the, the SWIFT plan uh, with the additional goals that are, or adjustments to the goals that have been made. And also our PAUSD counseling team uh, will be utilizing the CCGI platform as a tool for students to get calls and career planning information. Uh, goal number three, uh, our wellness. So here are some of the highlights. Elementary school received training on second step SEL along with, our, with some of our middle schools, or all of our middle schools, I would say. Uh, ongoing data review at the school sites to calibrate and enhance support and improve student attendance via our A to A program. Uh, continue, uh, the continuity of our music and VAPA after school uh, sports programs. Uh, action items for goal three, continue to enhance the mental health services and social emotional learning programs. Um, all elementary schools will have a full-time mental health uh, associate at all their sites. And continue uh, tier three strategies for students, student success coaches and safe specialists for students with chronic absenteeism. Uh, next steps will be to bring this item back based on feedback, feedback that we've received from some of our community members as well and make adjustments on this uh, document. So we'll bring this back on June 20th for the final adoption, and then we'll be uh, presenting it over to the county for their uh, final approval. But last but not least before, um, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to make sure we uh, included this. So this is year two for us. Next year is gonna be year three. So based on the feedback, we'll be making again the adjustments, but also we will be reviewing the three goals and make adjustments to them because we're gonna begin Next year, being part three, is going to be also be the cycle to create the next three year goals for the next three years after that. So that'll be a major process where we're going to have um, be able to provide uh, feedback or get get feedback from the community during that process to make adjustments or add additional goals if needed for this uh, our LCAP. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues, Ms. Siegel. Um, thank you so much. I read through the whole thing and just had a couple quick clarifying questions. Is evidence-based grading synonymous with standards-based grading? 
It is. So okay. it's essentially almost the same, but we're okay. taking an evidence-based approach. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think in addition to evidence-based standards-based grading, I think a huge key is calibrating the grading across courses, which is part of that. So I just hope the calibration part across the courses um, is interwoven. And I'm really happy to see improved attendance as a highlight. Um, what stuck out to me when reading through the whole packet was um, that the chronic absenteeism for our historically underrepresented students is still a big concern. Um, our Pacific Islander was 36%, African American 18%, Hispanic 20% and are homeless 46.4%. Um, I want to call out the hard work that Herb Espiritu and the site student success coaches and student and family engagement specialists, I know they are all working hard to decrease the number of chronically absent students through working with the families, but I just want to just say we still have work to do and I'm glad that we are in continuing to focus on that as a um, concern. I'm really Pleased to see that we're expanding our summer school programs. I think this is great, and the communication has been really clear to families. I think this district did a great job of expressing all the different options, um, and that there is a continued offering of buses during the summer. I think you did a great job of making that clear so that all of our students have access to our summer learning programs. And my one actual question is, is the increase of 12 behavioral intervention coaches and our second therapeutic service program. Is that included here? No, not in here. Okay. That was my, I just, is that included in our, um, in our budget for next year? Is that a separate? I'm just trying to under, like, because yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. be talking about that on the budget item. The LCAP represents less okay. than 1% of our, our funds for okay. the entire district. So that and, will be discussed in a different item. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hart? I don't have any questions. Okay. Ms. Letterman? Mr. Collins? Okay. Um, thank you so much for this. The only thought I have was I was looking through the LCAP was that. I'm thinking back to my first two years that I was on the board, and this was a huge undertaking because you really, as a board member who wasn't in all the LCAP meetings, you never knew what was gonna pop up in the LCAP. Like it could be all, and we'd ask clarifying questions, and what about this, and what about that? And now when I started to dig into it, I was like, oh, here's the promise. Like it's, it, go, it flows through everything, right? It's, it's all the same priority goals, and you see them everywhere in every different way. So I was just really excited when I looked at the LCAP. It's like, wow, the same. You, I could have predicted before I opened it what was going to be in here. And I see the alignment from our stated goals to what we're stating in our LCAP to our SIPs to everything else. It all kind of goes together. So um, I both appreciate all the work, and I appreciate that it is a predictable document for us now in a lot of ways. Um, and um, I'm, I'm glad to see it kind of align with what our district priorities are. Uh, thank you. And so next time we will see it for adoption, yes? Great, thank you. Uh, okay, 7B, which I think probably also has a presentation to it, is also a public hearing, and yet I believe has no comments. So I'm going to open the public hearing for the proposed budget, and then I'm going to, if there's no comments, close the public hearing, and I'm ready to hear the presentation. As you said earlier, it's only a $300 million item. So, yeah. Um, okay, I wanna turn this over to Ms. Chow, who will walk us through that. And, and the reason for the sequencing, by the way, LCAP first is the LCAP is a condition for approving a budget that has to be met. So that's why it goes first. In some districts, it's a tremendous amount of their overall budget in ours. It's a tiny, tiny sliver. But uh, regardless, that's the reason for the order. Okay, Ms. Chow. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Uh, this next item is the presentation of the proposed budget for the 23-24 school year. And there is a daunting amount of information attached to the agenda uh, related to this item. It represents months of work, not only from the business department, but from a collaboration of a variety of stakeholders as well as district leaders. Um, Ms. Yu and I will be sharing the highlights of this work. 
Uh, the state budget informs our district budget in several areas, but the state adopts their budget after the district adopts our budget. So for that reason, we use the data from the May revision because it is most current information we have at the time when we're doing our budget development. Any changes in the state's budget between the May revision and when the state later in June, when the state does adopt their budget, um, will be addressed at first interim in December. So the May revise was released mid-May. Mid Some of the highlights include uh, the announcement of a state budget short shortfall, uh, nearly $32 billion. That is an increase uh, in the shortfall since, um, of about $9.3 million since January when the governor first proposed the budget. Uh, the Legislative Analyst Office believes it's actually uh, quite higher for a variety of reasons. The statutory COLA is increased to 8.22%, and one might wonder why, if the state has a shortfall, how they are able to uh, bring forward a, a historical high of 8.22% COLA. And interestingly, the uh, COLA is not tied to state revenues. It's, it's purely a function of um, inflation and the CPI. Okay. Yeah, uh, also the uh, proposed in the budget is a new equity multiplier. I wanted to just comment on this real quick because of the robust work our district is doing around equity and the fact that it is uh, one of the goals in our, pro in our promise. Um, this is a, a different equity multiplier. Uh, one would think we were an ideal candidate for this, but this goes, this, these funds are going to schools that have very high um, poverty levels and over 85% uh, free meal, so it, it's, it's actually not funds uh, will be coming to PAUSD for this purpose. On the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, this is our ELOP. Um, no new funds in this, but there is some flexibility that was uh, proposed, and expenditures, we get another year in which to uh, use those funds. We have a couple of block grants and uh, some uh, troubling news with these two, as it's proposed in the May revise, the Art, Music, Instructional Materials Discretionary Block Grant has a 51% reduction from the funds that were allocated in this current year. For our district, it's a reduction of 3.2 million if that does end up going forward in the adopted budget. Uh, the second area uh, where we're seeing uh, an impact is with the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant. Here we have a proposed decrease of 32% from our current year budget. Uh, what's notable here is that not only is it 1.3 million for the district, but we've already received these funds, so in essence, we are going to have to write a check to the, the state for this. Now these are two of the one-time funds from the state, there's also one-time funds from the federal government that are sunsetting, and these would be the ESSER funds. Um, those funds, uh, just to let the board know that we do not have staff or ongoing expenditures tied to those funds uh, because we're very uh, judicious in how we uh, set up our budgets and not have ongoing funds tied to one-time money. So even though those federal funds are sunsetting, um, that was planned and it's not gonna be a uh, cause fiscal distress for the district. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Yu to uh, go over the budget adoption. Thank you, Ms. Chow. Um, tonight I will be presenting to you the estimated uh, actuals and projected budget for the upcoming fiscal year 23-24. We have carefully analyzed the financial data and prepared a comprehensive summary to guide, to guide us through the next four years. To provide an overview, we have um, prepared three slides that illustrate our multi-year projection for revenue, expenses, and the ending fund balance. In the first column um, of our revenue projection, we have current year's figure adjusted and projected at the year end. The second column represents the proposed budget for the next year and the subsequent three years. 
It is important to note that the total revenue has decreased by $7 million, which translates to a 2.4% decrease from the current year to the next. This decline is primarily attributed to decreases in one-time funds from federal and state, and as well as the local revenue. Um, under the local revenue, mainly is the donation. Those are budgeted uh, upon receipt. Our projected net property tax is estimated to increase by 3.8%, inclusive of secured, unsecured, and homeowner property tax relief for the next fiscal year, with a consistent 2% increase projected to the subsequent years. As for ongoing federal and state grant, we have budget, budgeted them at a flat rate. Um, we have also included the unspent dollars from one-time funding sources such as the Learning Recovery, Educator Effectiveness Grant, Art Music Instructional Material, and Expanded Learning Opportunity Grant. In terms of the local revenue, we anticipate a 3% increase in our lease revenue, um, a 2% increase in our parcel tax, and a 2% increase in our interest as an overall. Now let's move on to the expenditure side. The second slide demonstrated expenditure projection, which also indicate changes between the current and the next fiscal year. The expenditures are projected to increase by 7.5 million, equivalent to a 2.4% increase from the current to the next. The increase is primarily driven by the cost of the certificated and classified staffing and the benefits expenditure. It is worth mentioning that the step and column increases are projected at a 2% and the health welfare expenses are expected to rise by an average of 16% by January 2024. I would like also to acknowledge that our budget is a dynamic document that is based on the information available at the time of its creation. Since then, certain expenses have emerged that are not currently reflected in our budget. First, um, the district has not yet concluded with negotiation with our employee union, so salary adjustment and associated statutory benefits expenses are not included in our budget at this time. Additionally, we recently received information from our broker about an unforeseen significant increase in our health and welfare cost. This expense was not also accounted for when the budget was finalized. Lastly, um, we would like also to share um, the expansion of our um, school behavioral therapeutic program and transitional kindergarten classes. This initiative aims to provide comprehensive support to our students, which involves um, additional staffing from behavior intervention coaches, mental health therapists, therapeutic teacher, additional um, TK teachers, and instructional aid. And these are, are not included at the budget at the moment. Considering all of these factors, the general fund budget for 23-24 reflect a decrease in the ending fund balance of $2.3 million, representing a 2.6% decrease. The estimated actuals and projected budget for the next fiscal year present both challenges and opportunities. We are aware of the deficit in the ending fund balances and we are committed to addressing them proactively. We understand the importance of maintaining a healthy fund balance, therefore we will closely monitor and manage expenses to make the necessary adjustment as we see fit. Our goal is to ensure the long-term financial stability of our organization while continuing to provide exceptional education and support to our student. With that, I will turn it back to Ms. Chow. All right, thank you, Ms. Yu. So on our multi-year projections, just a quick reminder of what they are and what they are not. Um, as Ms. Yu mentioned, our budget is dynamic and probably this year we're seeing no better example of that than uh, we're presenting it to the board and we already know that we have some revisions to make. So uh, again, I just wanna say for the multi-year projections, they are based on the most accurate information we have at the time and sometimes uh, they change quicker than, than we anticipate. Next slide, please. Uh, what's coming up next, we had a fiscal advisory committee uh, 
a, a very productive meeting uh, last week. Our, our budget materials have all been available for public review. This is a, a requirement for the posting of our budget. And um, on June 15th, this is when the state adopts a budget. And then they uh, go into, uh, uh, they analyze, they, uh, the governor has the option to veto line items. And we really don't know what that state budget looks like until trailer bill language comes out. So what we do say June 15th, it, it generally is much um, closer to the end of June when we actually know uh, the, the true impact on the state budget. And as uh, Dr. Lopez mentioned, this will be coming back along with the LCAP at the June 20th board meeting. And then we will see these uh, revisions, some that we talked about tonight as well as others at our December board meeting when we uh, present the first interim to the board. And that concludes the presentation for budget adoption. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start on this side this time. Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very clear. Um, and generally generally good news, I'd say. Um, you, you mentioned the thing that I was gonna ask about, which was the um, what people are calling the fiscal cliff with ESSER three funds and, you know, in, in general, COVID relief funds that are coming to an expiration date in, what is it, June of next year? Mm -hmm. End of fiscal year next year. Um, having, today, giving you guys all some insight into what my life is like. I spent some time today watching the LA Unified School Board meeting. Um, <laughs> and uh, their, well, their reading, pro, their reading program was also on the agenda. Um, and, and, and it was interesting because in part it was on the agenda because of the item before, which was not the CBO, but the superintendent giving a long presentation about the, the relatively dire fiscal circumstances that their district faces with the coming of uh, the fiscal cliff for ESSER funds. Um, and uh, the, the fact that they're gonna have to lay off probably thousands of people in LA Unified um, because they have funded um, permanent positions with one-time money uh, through the pandemic while they've seen a dramatic reduction in both you know, overall enrollment and average daily attendance because of chronic absenteeism is way up. So it was startling to see the kind of situation that they are in. In contrast, our situation looks, while you know, there was a little bit of red ink on the out-year projections, um, it looked like something that we were well well within what we are capable of managing and 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 called out very clearly and anticipated by our our, our team. So it makes me feel really good about our fiscal situation, and I think we should keep talking about about our relative stability and and uh, and our plan and that, that we plan appropriately for the uh, to cushion ourselves against fiscal blows. Because I think the next few years in California is going to be a very long trail of dire news about layoffs and school closings as uh, the ESSER money runs out and people are, um, and, AD, and the Hold Harmless and the LCFF runs out and people find themselves having to live with much smaller budgets than they have now. So all that made me feel very, in contrast, I think our presentation made me feel very positive about our prospects. So thank you for that. Um, I had a, qu a quick question about the local revenues. It seemed like there was a big increase, and now we're going back to. So I saw it, it looked like attachment B said there was a $2 million increase from second interim to estimated actuals, but it looked like our estimated actuals was actually $6 million more than 23 20, than what's estimated for 23 24. Was that, I mean, I know you explained something about parcel tax and pie, but it didn't seem like such a it seemed like a lot more money. Miss Yu, do you mind going back to that slide on the revenue? I know, it looks like a lot more money. So what we, what's, what's unique about the local revenue is that in this district, we have very generous parent uh, support. And that support comes to us in terms um, PTA, general parent donations, as well as, of, of course, PI. When we receive that revenue, because it's donations, 
We record it at the time it's received. We don't budget for those funds. Okay, so it's just not in the budget. At it's, all. It is not in the budget. We, okay. we add it when it's received. And also another thing I would add to that is because this year we did um, receive a significant donation um, to um, Pali to their library. So that's also the difference between the 22, 23 and to the next fiscal year. Thank you. And then to clarify, you said that the salaries, so the 11 behaviorists that we're hiring, those aren't included in this uh, adopted budget for, well, for 23, 24 that we're adopting right now. Correct. So we're adopting it, but okay. well, next meeting. Next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to say thank you for answering my question in this section. Um, and when, because this is you know my first time doing this, when will that big item be included in the budget? What's kind of the timeline for that? Um, that is first in her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you for this. Thank you for bringing us through the process all the way along. I think the, the one thing that's just sort of got my attention, I, and I did not like run specific numbers, but I saw in the, in the out years, we are, we are using some of our reserves, right? Or we're in the red, if you will. Um, and we're in the red in those years while we have not yet counted the behaviorists and we have not yet talked about raises or any, you know, so it feels like it's, probably, granted things may change, but it's probably gonna be even bigger, I guess, deficits, you'd say, than that, right? Um, especially you talked about the increase in um, benefits, right, the increase in cost of benefits, which probably still has to be negotiated exactly what percentages, but um, but these things are, are bigger ticket items that are gonna make it us even tighter, right? Two things. Our Benefits are already pre-negotiated, so we already know what the split is on that. Oh, great. So so how come they weren't in, included in here, then, if it's already negotiated? I'm talking about the percentages when we get the actual number. Ah, because we don't have the actual number. That's okay. all in there. The other part, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Ms. Chow, so if we don't know this answer right now, it's okay. Um, I'm just wondering what that uh, the additions that we did make that are not included in this budget that will be in first interim. Do we have a ballpark number on that again? If not, we can have it at the next meeting. Well, I could give you a better uh, ballpark figure at the next meeting because I think we also had in question a third grade class as yeah. well, so. Let, let's just do it then. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, okay, that was a discussion item. So thank you so much for the presentation. We look forward to seeing it next time. Uh, we are on to information items. We have 8B and 8D that have public comments. So I'll just start with those. Um, 8B is the Mental Health Ad Hoc Committee update. We have four commenters. Stephanie Ackers-Wright, Maria Delord-Zavaldla, Stephen Davis, and Akshaya Ardia. So Stephanie, it says in person, but oh, there's, yes. She's like dancing in the aisles. <laughs> it is like awake. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that the topic of mental health, this is a very broad topic. Um, I want to relate how this topic relates to behavior. When we see explosive behaviors in schools, when we see children acting out in unspeakable ways, this is directly related to mental health. And I want to again turn your attention to the collaborative and proactive solutions model of Dr. Ross Green, author of The Explosive Child. He's author of many other books that are available for, I don't know, 30 or less dollars on Amazon each, um, for mere hundreds of dollars. Any person in this room, any teacher in our school district could educate themselves about this model. I can't say what the exact cost it would be to implement this model throughout our district, but I'm pretty sure it's cheaper than the cost of 11 behaviorists that are probably not trained in a proactive model such as this. I just finished a course in positive behavioral supports and that whole course is focused on what is late. Being late, focusing on observable behaviors 
is late. Focusing on de-escalation is late. Focusing on coping strategies is late. We need to be early. We need to be talking to these kids. We need to have the skills ourselves to have that conversation of what is getting in their way. What are they stuck on? That is what their behavior is communicating to us. I am stuck. There are expectations that I am having difficulty meeting because I do not have the skills to meet them. We need to be trained in how do we have that conversation and the collaborative and proactive solutions model provides us with a framework to do that very thing. There are free resources, livesinthebalance.com, countless webinars on YouTube. Please take an hour of your time to look for yourself. I can't recommend it enough. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Maria Delord Zavala, who might be on Zoom. Okay, Stephen, and then Akshaya. Um, I was looking at this presentation, and it reminded me of the behavioral presentation last week. And we look at these things almost as if they're silos and they're not. Mental health, behavior, disability, discipline, and the culture of our school district are inseparable from each other. <clears throat> a laundry list of good things to do is not a system and actually shouldn't be what you all are approving. What, uh, you know, again, I'll get back to, you know, we standing ovation for the reading stuff. Why? Data. What do we not have on where we're at with, uh, with mental health or, um, uh, or, or behavior? Data. Uh, how many kids are getting, you know, MTSS? How many kids are hitting, getting into tier one? How many at tier two? How many at tier three? Uh, why didn't we get them at tier one or tier two when they, when they hit us at tier three? Um, as you know, I talk to a lot of people about disability matters. Um, and I'm always talking to parents of kids who have more notable dysregulation problems about uh, the ERMS assessment, which wasn't even mentioned. And it's education-related mental health services, but the gateway to that is an assessment, which is one of those things uh, every parent has a right to ask for under IDEA. Um, there's no system we're proposing. We need data, you know, I, I throw out the data on suspension because it's the only data I can see, but it shouldn't be the only data you can see, and it's showing some severe problems. So uh, I look forward to an actual system of management of problems and not a nice list of things that we probably should be doing, but we need a system to make uh, the things actually better. Thank you. Thank you. And the last commenter is Akshaya, who it says in person, but I do not see her online. Is there a bird? Hello. Oh, is that Akshaya? Yes? Great. Uh, yes. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm back on. I just wanted to. Uh, just ask the board if, uh, you know, you could provide more, again, back to more trainings for the aides, especially uh, in the classroom as well as teachers, uh, because I've, I've seen instances where the aide uh, clearly needs to understand how different neurotypes work. And because of lack of training, I've seen people holding kids down for doing party and things that are generally not advised by other people. So I, I just wanted to understand like what's the level of training that the AIDS uh, classroom, or sorry, the the one-on-one AIDS or the um, AIDS who work with uh, the neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse kids get. Um, the other point that I've uh, uh, recently come across is uh, Los Altos Unified has um, more rigorous training for their classroom aids and other behaviors and you know almost to the level of an rbt in um, you know in some cases so i in comparison Palo Alto does not so if if you could probably 
provide that. I think there there's a clear correlation between classroom behaviors and especially with you know um, our um, students with disabilities or people who nonverbal kids who can't express themselves but need support in the classroom. Um, it's just better for, to integrate everybody into the um, the classroom environments there. And so, yeah, that's the only thing I wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, board colleagues, any comments or questions about mental health? Um, can I just ask, was this the end of that group? This is the final report from that group? Okay, and obviously there's a lot, of, a lot going on with mental health in our district. Um, now that the ad hoc is over, do you just anticipate in the fall, like, what would our next update be? Just, uh, I mean, I feel like in the past we've gotten sort of information about our wellness centers and how many people are using them or, you know, our MTSS progress. Well, I, I think mental health, as some of our speakers suggested, shows up all over the place. Ad hoc that had a very specific sliver of the problem. Um, so I think to answer your question, part, part of it, and, and this is uh, not to be funny, will be solved tomorrow when we start talking about the calendar for next year and we start placing those items. Okay, thank you. Um, the other information item that has a public comment is D, uh, the evaluation of legal firms. And we have one commenter, Edith Cohen. Yeah, hi, everyone. So uh, first, this uh, concern with improving its uh, legal support. And recently, uh, post discriminated against special ed students, refused to discuss it with the impacted family, and now facing a federal investigation by the Office of Civil Rights. Post for years violated laws meant to ensure proper mass placement of students. This resulted in a lawsuit that caused the loss. The response is to obfuscate information, double down on their own interpretations of the law, and actively look for the maximum deviations from the intent of the law that they can get away with. So any large organization needs the legal support, but when an org lacks transparency and lost the trust of its customer, it needs it more. And when intentionally one is using practices that violate laws that are intended to protect the interests of the customers, they need it even more. And then when the habit is to double down on its practices rather than obey court orders, then it's even worse. So POS needs a very good lawyer to defend its practices. And it's also in an enviable position that we, the taxpayers, also pay for, the, and the customers also pay for all these uh, legal expenses, uh, regardless or not of whether uh, POS wins or loses uh, their cases. So maybe it's time to take a little bit of a different approach, uh, rebuild trust with the community and operate more transparently uh, follow the law when uh, people point out that the practices are unlawful, uh, correct them, uh, make policies that are driven by data and evidence and be transparent about it so people understand why you're doing things and also aim to serve all students. Isn't it better than just spending money on uh, more lawyers to defend undefensible practices? Um, Thank you, Ms. Cohn. Uh, any comments or questions on this? Great. Okay. Um, any other info items that any board members want to comment? Okay. We have board operations. Ms. Siegel. I'd love to keep this tall, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, it is short, but I like to highlight celebrations. And I had the wonderful privilege and honor of attending Fletcher and Gunn's graduation and even stayed late helping gun students check in for the grad night party as it was wonderful being surrounded by happy students full of joy and optimism about the future. Um, I, the students' speeches were incredible. If there is a place for the community to hear those students' speeches, I highly recommend parents find them. For me, they were um, inspiring. One was humorous and one was so heartfelt that it brought me um, to tears. And not only were the student speeches incredible, but I want to give a special shout out here to English teacher Terence Katata, who received the principal's cup at that graduation ceremony for the most honored teacher. I loved listening to the student quotes about him and the other teacher quotes about him. 
And it was interesting because I turned around and two of the honored teachers on the stage were two of the teachers that inspired me to go into teaching. And so those quotes that the students were saying about the teacher, it matters. These teachers matter. They change lives. And it was just nice to be celebrating students and also celebrating teachers together and being able to witness it. Um, I just felt very fortunate. Mr. Dart. Okay, I'm going to go since we're going down the line here. Um, just want to celebrate one particular builder tonight, um, Kendall Launer, who I think is a teacher on special assignment probably at, in, at, in our high schools. Um, we spent a lot of time tonight talking about ESRI and our elementary school, the progress we've made in elementary school reading. And um, Ms. Launer is a secondary teacher in our secondary schools who is doing the work of identifying, I mean, she's not the only one, but she is leading that work of identifying and supporting students who maybe went through our system before we were at ESRI going and who maybe um, were not given all the supports they needed to, to be successful in their, in their literacy lives in high school. Um, and she is using uh, multiple measures to identify which students uh, might benefit from some intervention from iReady and Lexia and midterm exams and great school classroom grades um, and identifying kids that would benefit or might benefit from a class that they could take um, that also offers dual enrollment. Um, and I'm just really excited that we have got staff members who are identifying those holes of, you know, those places of need and filling them and going above and beyond to just do whatever is necessary to try to fill them. Um, so I want to recognize her. And um, the graduations were wonderful. I went to JLS and Pally. Um, we got to recognize students. We got to recognize retiring staff. Um, and they were just wonderful celebrations. Nope, nope. All right, well, 9.51, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>